You may have heard of Meals on Wheels, but have you ever wondered about the naval military equivalent? The United States Navy has officially taken mobile mealtime to the next level. Every day that an American nuclear-powered aircraft carrier spends at sea, it has to provide three square meals for the 5,000 hungry sailors who call the ship home. The resulting process is a mind-boggling marvel of culinary engineering. If you're doing the math, I'll spare you the mental gymnastics. That's over 17,000 meals, seven days a week, 365 days a year. How, you ask, is this even possible? Let's find out. They say the way to someone's heart is through their stomach. This certainly applies to hungry American sailors of the US Navy. Aboard the most common aircraft carrier in the Navy fleet, the 100,000-ton Nimitz-class vessel, an average crew complement of between 5,000 and 6,000 sailors will spend months on deployment working, sleeping, and eating aboard their city at sea. Whether you're busy scrubbing the flight deck, flying an F-A-18F Super Hornet, maintaining the nuclear reactor, or overseeing the arresting gear operation, the elementary needs of this crew are truly staggering. Feeding thousands of people in a relatively cramped space requires a Herculean logistical effort. On any given day, a carrier's crew can consume more than 1,600 pounds of chicken, 160 gallons of milk, 30 cases of cereal, and 350 pounds of lettuce, noted Chief Petty Officer Naomi Goodwin, herself responsible for preparing officers' meals aboard an aircraft carrier. Because carriers can spend months at sea, they often deplete their perishable items like fruits and vegetables before the deployment is complete. To compensate, they stock up with as much perishable food as possible at the beginning of a deployment. Once the fresh food disappears, canned or dried goods can only get you so far. To maintain morale as stocks dwindle, a carrier's supply crew is regularly in contact with wholesale distributors who work to replenish stocks whenever a carrier comes near a port. When US Navy warships have to resupply at sea, they use a process called underway replenishment. Getting the food aboard is probably the hardest part. The alongside connective replenishment method is the most common form of underway replenishment. When a supply vessel pulls up to the carrier, it must match its speed on a parallel trajectory, a daunting task in rough seas and choppy winds. Once in place, the two ships are connected by a hotline, followed by a much heavier duty messenger line, which facilitates the transfer of heavy pallets loaded with food, mail, fuel, and other supplies. Coasting across the open watery chasm separating the two vessels, the carrier's crew pulls in heavy palletized cargo and begins storing boxes of pineapples, tomatoes, apples, onions, potatoes, and more in one of the carrier's fluorescent lit refrigeration and dry storage units. Replete with hanging ethylene filters that preserve products over longer periods by trapping gases that cause ripening, refrigeration units are traditionally located in a centralized area several decks beneath the galley. Vertically stacking galleys and storage areas was a deliberate design choice, giving cooks easy access to the ingredients they need at mealtime using hydraulic lifts and elevators. Resupply occurs every week or so, adding between 400,000 and 1 million pounds of food to the carrier's stocks. If necessary, supplies can also be delivered vertically via helicopter or light aircraft when the situation arises. The five galleys aboard the Nimitz commissioned in 1975 differ from their more modern counterpart, the USS Ford Supercarrier, commissioned in 2017. While the ships have the same footprint, one journalist observed, space all over the Ford has been reimagined to make carrier life and work better and more efficient. Rather than five galleys, the Ford has two, one centralized in the aft section of the ship, the other forward to serve the carrier's air wing. All right, so far so good. No one's going hungry anytime soon. But what about drinking water? You need a lot of it to hydrate thousands of sailors in what is often a hot and humid work environment. Luckily, modern aircraft carriers have world-class desalination facilities on board. These portable water plants work almost like a distillery. Water is superheated to steam, then condensed using cooled pipes. Minerals are added as the water is filtered for drinking and general use. All this is powered using the ship's nuclear reactor, which itself only has to be refueled every 25 years. Pretty amazing stuff. While we're on the topic of facilities, wondering what kind of monster kitchen you'd need to service all these sailors, here's the thing. It's not about size, it's about efficiency. A carrier's cooking facilities have been well designed to cater to the masses. They have to be. A carrier is designed for efficiency. Below deck, snaking, maze-like corridors and tiny rooms take advantage of every inch of available space. 
Kitchens are cramped, filled to the brim with the latest industrial cooking machinery, huge stoves that make the temperature soar in that confined interior space, automated self-cleaning convection ovens that can cook any kind of meat in a variety of ways, commercial-grade mixing bowls, rows upon rows of warming trays, soup vats, tilt skillets, deep fryers, broilers, commercial toasters, microwaves, food storage containers, drying racks, busing carts, food processors, prep tables, blenders, and more. All this equipment enables culinary specialists to cook huge batches of food for the sailors aboard. What does it all cost to feed a crew this size? Well, grab your wallet because it'll cost a pretty penny. Senior Chief Francis Pattel, a culinary specialist aboard the George H.W. Bush, estimated that the Navy spends somewhere between $45,000 to $65,000 a day on food at sea. That's $1.8 million a month. It's pretty good bang for your buck considering what you get. 16 to 18,000 meals a day, from 6 a.m. breakfasts through to the aptly named mid-rats or midnight rations. But how do the meals actually get prepared? Teams of chefs, known as culinary specialists, form the dream team aboard the carrier. There are around 93 culinary specialists in all who follow a strict 15-day menu cycle to simplify the meal selection process. The regimented cooking process has been optimized for mass production. Cooks spend hours bulk prepping huge batches of food, a constant responsibility that can be monotonous at times. To add variety to their own schedules, junior cooks are trained on different tasks to make them more versatile in the galley. It is hard work, sometimes at strange hours. The breakfast shift can wake up as early as 3 a.m. to have enough time to prepare enough pancake batter, sausages, oatmeal, eggs, and bacon to go round. Cooks tend to work 12 to 16 hour shifts that involve prep work, serving, and cleaning. Punctuality and quality are key. Culinary specialists are held to high standards, the same as those they serve on a daily basis. Special meals punctuate an otherwise routine menu offering. Anything from Taco Tuesday to a Mongolian grill and a special birthday meal each calendar month that can include a tablecloth, wine glasses, nice music, and a main course of prime rib or lobster are sure morale boosters. On most naval vessels, officers eat in their own mess, known as a wardroom, smaller and more refined than the canteen area. An officer's mess boasts padded chairs, tablecloths, and glasses of Coke garnished with slices of lemon. In the wardroom, cooks stick to the same menu cycle as their counterparts in the general mess, but smaller amounts of people to feed, in the hundreds rather than the thousands, means they can take time to cook and present the food a bit more luxuriously. The wardroom, of course, still isn't the finest dining establishment aboard ship. That is reserved for the captain's cabin, a modest-sized room with hints of the old-fashioned ocean liner about it, where a personal chef diverges from the standard menu, preparing fresh meals for the captain and their guests from whatever ingredients they can find on the ship. Yes, sailors on deployment tend to eat far better than their land-based counterparts in the field. Nobody eats MREs at sea. Underway replenishment adds freshness to shipboard food, even if it is prepared on an industrial scale. One of the favorite meals at sea is chicken wings, but to serve it, culinary specialists must prepare 1,600 kilograms of chicken each time, a number that reinforces the logistical scale of this insane feeding operation. To bring in that home-cooked taste, bakers make use of massive 60-pound dough mixers to make their own bread, rolls, cookies, and other baked goods. Cooking meals from scratch, sometimes in the view of the serving area, communicates how much the Navy values its service members. Veterans often complain that naval chow served in decades past was subpar and inedible. Today, that's no longer the case. It may not be your mother's cooking, but daily meals are meticulously planned and served to be as calorically dense and nutrient-rich as possible. They have to be to fortify sailors working hard on their feet, day in, day out. A look into a daily shift for a culinary specialist reveals how much effort is required to cook for an entire carrier crew. At mealtime, broad, heated grills are prepared and manned by young cooks who have the raw food at hand. If, say, a cook is serving lamb, he arranges lamb chop after lamb chop in neat rows until the entire surface is covered with meat, 150 chops at least. By the time the last one is in place, it's time to return to the beginning and flip the meat over to cook on the other side. If the chefs are cooking roast beef, they will slice roughly 600 pounds of meat per meal. Dinner is perhaps the busiest meal of the day. By evening, the main eating bay becomes crowded. Serving lines quickly materialize as sailors find their way to the commissary for some hot chow. Each grabs a plate, utensils, a cup, and napkins, cleaned during downtime by members of the culinary specialist crew, and begins indicating what they'd like served. 
Back in 2011, a journalist for the National News observed this process firsthand. Mashed potato and steak with gravy is proving to be a popular choice, but there's also barbecue chicken, stir-fry, pasta, and chicken with tomato sauce on offer. Three young sailors, Jennifer Penner, Elvin Carmona Rivera, and Sarah Strong, are lingering in the cafeteria area, having just finished their meals. They say that while the food on board is perfectly fine, the special fried rice is a particular favorite. They do crave homemade rather than mass-produced meals. I look forward to eating something that's cooked from scratch, just for me, says Strong. This is okay, but you can tell it's been prepared for hundreds of people. Where the general mess doesn't satisfy a sailor's specific cravings, they can browse a small grocery store where different amenities like hygiene goods, razors, junk food, drinks are available to keep morale high at all times. Carrier grocery stores can make $10,000 a day, showing just how vital they are to the ship's daily operations. Even if it isn't the freshest or most gourmet offering, the fact that the Navy can provide hot chow thousands of miles from land in any condition is nothing short of a modern marvel. It is true that by the time naval sailors reach land once more, they are eager for fresh-cooked food they might once have taken for granted. Wood-fired pizza, mum's home-cooked lasagna, freshly squeezed orange juice, and more are the tantalizing rewards of a deployment well done. This doesn't detract from the impressive service on display in the galleys and storerooms of America's aircraft carriers. The science and logistics behind the process of cooking at sea is truly impressive. Spending seven to ten months at a time at sea, cooking crews ensure that good food is prepared and delivered in spades, on time, every day. Have you ever tried Navy chow aboard an aircraft carrier or experienced anything like the Navy's feeding operation? Let us know in the comments and don't forget to subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. Do you think you have what it takes to be a submariner? The US Navy deploys three submarine classes, the 170.69-meter Ohio class, the 107.6-meter Seawolf class, and the 115-meter Virginia class. Not for the claustrophobic, perhaps, but otherwise livable, or so it seems. Now imagine sharing that tight space with about 150 other people on deployments that last months at a time with little or no outside communication, and you have your basic submariner's lifestyle. It can be hard to get along with other people in such close proximity for six months at a time, especially when you'll likely need to wind up sharing your bed with someone else. Submarines only have a limited space to store their weapons, supplies, and essential systems. In fact, the nuclear reactor on a submarine takes up a third of its total space, so conditions on the vessel are even more cramped than its dimensions suggest. Personal space is therefore an oxymoron on a submarine, and this fact extends even to the most intimate of settings. Unlike their naval counterparts on surface ships, Submariners do not even get their own beds, as there is simply not enough room for each crew member to have a unique bed. For example, the Virginia-class submarine only has 94 beds for its crew of 135 members. The crew must therefore rotate in and out, with some members on duty and others taking their chance for sleep in the downtime. Each sailor has an 8-hour shift of duty. Submarines are often unsanitary. Even going to the bathroom is difficult. Flushing the toilet sends waste to one of three sanitary tanks that are meant to eventually discharge outside the vessel and into the sea. However, if the valves involved in the process of discharging are not lined up correctly, the urine and excrement are sent somewhere else on the vessel, which can include the kitchen. The cramped nature of a submarine naturally lends itself to argument and conflict. Even disciplined sailors might find it tough to cope. Successful submariners must get along with one another, though, because they won't be able to talk to anyone else for a long time. Surface ships, which patrol the blue oceans, don't have constant internet access, but submerging beneath the waves brings communication difficulties into a league of their own. Forget taking calls, much less going on Skype or Zoom, even emails can't get out most of the time, and submarines can spend as many as 90 days of their deployments completely submerged. So submariners can disappear for months on end to their friends and family members back home, which probably adds a lot of stress to marriages. With such cramped conditions and sparse communications for months on end, Submariners need to have something to pass the time, and watching TV is not an option. Instead, crew members often participate in rituals. One of them includes running through a gauntlet of ice-cold water hoses, sometimes with urine in the mixture, while holding an M&M to place in a comrade's belly button at the end of the journey. Another ritual includes the male sailors dressing up as women and performing strip teases. Yep, anything to relieve the boredom. Fortunately, modern submarines have good air conditioning and climate control systems, so submariners don't have the weather to add to their woes most of the time. It was not always so, and even now, there is great danger in the rare possibility that the vessel's climate control systems fail. 
One such incident occurred in 2011, when a Royal Navy submarine patrolling in the Indian Ocean saw its air conditioning fail. Temperatures on the vessel rose rapidly, reaching 140 degrees Fahrenheit, and many of the crew collapsed. The captain ordered the submarine to dive over 200 meters deep into the water, which finally brought the temperatures down, but it was a close call for everyone on board. There is one perk to being a submariner. The kitchens aboard one serve up the best food in the military, baked lobster tails, beef rice soup with baked potatoes, fresh oven-baked bread, and for dessert, French pastries. In fact, the Culinary Institute of America, one of the top chef schools in the country, often finds submarine cooks enrolled in its students' list. Unfortunately, if you're a submariner, you won't have much time to savor the dishes in front of you, because the eating conditions are just as cramped as the sleeping quarters. The mess decks need to be small to save space, and can usually accommodate only between six and a dozen people at a time. With crew members waiting behind at any given moment, eating time is limited, because they need to eat also. Because the job is so tough, submarines are an all-volunteer setting, and crew members wear their service badge with honor. They deserve at least that much. The F-22 Raptor was the world's most advanced fighter jet when it made its first flight in 1997. And here's why the first ever fifth-generation fighter jet is still the best in the world. When it rolled off the production lines, it captured the imagination and attention of many with its sleek, futuristic, yet intimidating design. It was originally conceived to deal with the Cold War threat of highly effective Russian dogfighter jets. The wars in Korea and Vietnam showed that American fighters could really struggle against enemy jets, especially ones with experienced Soviet pilots behind the stick. New stealth and other tech advances allowed American Pentagon officials to dream up the ultimate fighter jet. And while this fighter was not produced in the numbers originally conceived of and has been given a much shorter projected service life, it is still the undisputed king of the skies. The F-22 Raptor's story begins in the early 1980s. Eager to maintain America's edge in air superiority fighters, the US Air Force began looking for a replacement for the F-15C Eagle. In 1990, a fly-off between the Northrop YF-23 and the Lockheed Martin YF-22 resulted in the service choosing the YF-22, later renamed the F-22 Raptor as a future cornerstone of American air power. Early on, the US Air Force believed that 750 of the new fighters would cost approximately $26.2 billion. By 1990, with the Cold War virtually over, President George H.W. Bush's administration trimmed the buy to 648 aircraft. By 1997, that number dropped again to just 339. And by 2003, the number had been reduced again, this time to 277. By 2009, that number was cut once more to just 187 units, plus eight testing and development aircraft, and the production line was terminated. While a combination of factors led to this massive decrease in fleet size, it was a lack of any adversary for the F-22 to really take on that pushed it over the edge. The Pentagon just could not justify the high price tag without any other nations even being close to fielding a comparable fighter. The program's path to deployment was a long one too. The Advanced Tactical Fighter Project, which would lead to the F-22 Raptor, began in 1981. The plane's prototype, the YF-22, had its first flight in 1990, and the aircraft achieved initial operating capability in 2005, meaning there were 24 years from inception to a final combat-ready aircraft being delivered. By comparison, the F-15 Eagle went from design selection to first flight in just seven years, from 1965 to 1972, and achieved initial operating capability in 1976, after only 11 years. In other words, the F-22 took more than twice as long to develop than the F-15. During that time, the Soviet Union went from competing superpower to the dust heap, dissolving in 1991. The mighty Soviet Air Force was broken up among the surviving republics, and fighter development in the newly formed countries was restricted to upgrading existing designs, such as the MiG-29 and the Su-30. Few in number and flown by pilots with minimal flight hours during the lean economic years of the 1990s, they presented no compelling reason to rush the F-22. The F-22 also gained an air-to-ground capability during this time, extending its usefulness. The F-22 was also a victim of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. The immense cost of supporting two low-intensity conflict wars simultaneously made expenses for fighting a peer competitor who didn't actually exist at the time difficult to justify. In fact, the F-22 wasn't deployed to Iraq or Afghanistan at all. 
with its only fight being a budget battle against weapon systems vital for the wars the United States was actually fighting. The F-22 was, fairly or not, often depicted as a program funded at the expense of the mine-resistant ambush-protected vehicles that saved ground troops in Iraq and Afghanistan from the dangers of improvised explosive devices. The lengthy development period also put the F-22 in indirect competition with the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter. Although different aircraft designed for different roles, the F-35 was a cheaper aircraft with similar, and in some cases greater capabilities than the F-22, and it apparently played a role in Defense Secretary Robert Gates recommending F-22 termination. As Gates did so, he recommended accelerating the F-35 program instead. Gates predicted that the United States would have 1,700 F-35s by 2025, a number that, given the cost overruns and delays of the controversial program, the Pentagon is unlikely to meet. Yet even with a limited number of these fighters and no new ones set to roll off, they remain one of the main capabilities boasted by the world's greatest air force. And here's why. Each engine produces 35,000 pounds of thrust, more than any other fighter in the world today. One M61A2 20mm cannon with 480 rounds, internal side weapons bay carriage of two AIM-9 infrared air-to-air -air missiles, and internal main weapons bay carriage of six AIM-120 radar-guided air-to-air missiles, or two 1,000-pound GBU 32J dams, and two AIM-120 radar-guided air-to-air missiles. The combination of the sophisticated aero design, high thrust to weight ratio, thrust vectoring, and advanced flight controls allows the aircraft to outmaneuver any adversary currently in existence. When we combine the intense armament, maneuverability, and overall power of the aircraft with its stealth profile, something that provides it with a radar cross section the size of a marble, we see a nearly unbeatable air superiority aircraft. Even though this is still the undisputed king of the skies, its days are unfortunately numbered. The Air Force is far more committed and confident in the F-35 for the future, and is even rumored to already be working on a sixth generation aircraft. With dogfights becoming more of a rarity with each passing year, it's hard to imagine the F-22 will remain needed. But until then, it will retain its place as the world's greatest air superiority fighter. Have you ever wondered how unpredictable forces of nature have shaped the fate of naval operations, even in the modern era? The weather has always been of decisive importance in military campaigns. At sea, the danger of bad weather is even more pronounced for military personnel than on land. Many naval operations have met a disastrous end at the hands of storms, and these incidents are not all in the ancient past. We've seen such disasters as recently as 2022, when the Thai ship HTMS Sukhothai, which was originally built in the United States, capsized and sank during a storm that hit it during an operation off the Gulf of Thailand. 106 sailors were on board the ship at the time. The Sukhothai was buffeted by 10-foot waves as it sank. While most of the crew was fortunately rescued, 29 of the sailors died. In the history of the United States Navy, 39 ships have been lost in weather-related episodes. However, no losses have occurred since 1949, when the USS Cochino foundered off the Norwegian coast during a polar gale that caused an electric fire and two battery explosions. How has the US Navy protected its ships and sailors from the elements since then? Let's take a look at some of the ways the Navy has guarded its ships against the wrath of Mother Nature and what it may do to improve that process in the future. On the open ocean, weather conditions are much rougher than those seen in shallower waters. Hurricanes or typhoons on the high seas can create waves up to 300 feet high. These waves can not only swallow a ship, but also impart tremendous kinetic energy that can disrupt a vessel's movement and potentially capsize it. Even if the ship simply rocks under the force of the wave, that disruption can move heavy machinery around and injure sailors. Prior to the advent of steam power, ships were often at the complete mercy of such storms. With the steamship, ships had better defenses by being able to head into the wind. By the turn of the 20th century, as weather predictions got more accurate and radio communications technology began to take off, ships were better protected, although there were still catastrophic incidents. For example, the USS Cyclops was lost along with its entire crew on March 4, 1918, and we still don't know exactly how it happened. By World War II, Ships had better defenses through improved communications and weather monitoring methods. Ground observers, aircraft patrols, and weather warnings 
gave sailors more prior knowledge of storms, but disaster could still be sudden. In December 1944, a typhoon struck the Pacific Fleet. It capsized three destroyers that were assisting operations in the Philippines. Nine other ships were seriously damaged. 790 sailors were lost, as were 196 planes. Today, ships are much better protected against severe weather, thanks first and foremost to satellite imagery, radar mapping, and even better communications. The US Navy gets timely information on weather patterns from eight meteorology and oceanography centers in the Atlantic, Pacific, and Indian Oceans to provide up-to-date information on storm patterns. The crew of a US Navy ship can also link up with weather satellites that monitor clouds, currents, water temperature, air temperature, ice, dust, and more. US Navy and Allied ships, therefore, have much more advanced warning of incoming severe weather events and know how to avoid them. Weather buoys are a ship's second line of defense against adverse natural phenomena. The Navy currently forward deploys over 1,000 of these instruments in the world's oceans. These buoys can act as beacons, measuring things like local atmospheric pressure, air temperature, and water temperature. The buoys then relay this information back to the US Navy ships. Since tropical cyclones form in areas of low pressure with high water temperature, knowing these locations beforehand allows a ship to avoid a potential encounter with a hurricane or typhoon. The US Navy also links with NOAA's latest National Weather Service prediction models, such as WaveWatch 3, which was released in March 2019. Tracking severe weather is so important to both the United States Navy and Air Force that they have a specialized command for it too, called the Joint Typhoon Warning Center. This command was founded in 1959 and was originally in Guam, but is today based at Pearl Harbor, having moved there in January 1999. The command monitors and forecasts tropical cyclone development and movement across the Pacific and Indian Oceans, which account for 90% of the world's tropical cyclonic activity. With the elevated importance of the Indo-Pacific region in today's geopolitics, the JTWC is even more important for the US Navy than it was at the start of the 21st century. The ships of the US Navy have their own instruments for tracking and predicting weather too. These include anemometers to track wind speed and direction, barometers to measure atmospheric pressure, and localized weather radars to detect storms and rainfall. With all of these tools and data, US Navy navigators are well prepared to plot optimal routes, moving to areas of higher pressure, clearer skies, and calmer seas. These tools allow naval navigators the ability to optimize the speed and direction of their vessels to keep them level with the waves. Such procedures not only prevent the ship from capsizing, but they also help to keep the crew healthy by preventing seasickness. However, severe weather events are often unpredictable even with advanced warning and predictive models. Hurricanes and typhoons frequently move in ways that prior tracking did not predict. Often, only the general location and path of a storm can be predicted with certainty far out in advance. It's often only within 24 hours or less that you can truly know if a hurricane is about to hit you directly. One such example of this danger occurred in October 2015, when a merchant ship called the SS El Faro was lost along with all of its 33 crew members after getting hit by the eye wall of Hurricane Joaquin, a powerful Category 4 hurricane that formed in the Caribbean. The El Faro would have had its own way of getting advanced warning about the hurricane, and yet it did not prevent the disaster. Early warning systems only go so far, so there are specific engineering techniques on the US Navy's vessels that are designed to withstand extreme weather events. On the engineering side, the US Navy's first order of business in keeping its ships afloat is to maintain a low center of gravity. Things with a lower center of gravity have less of a chance of losing their balance or capsizing than things that have a higher center of gravity. To keep the center of gravity on its ships low, the US Navy stores its fuel and heaviest equipment in the lowest parts of the vessel. In other words, equipment on a US Navy ship is not distributed randomly. The ship's engineers carefully calculate where to store the equipment in a bid to provide maximum buoyancy, where the mass of the vessel is equal to the upward pressure that the water exerts. Cruise ships use the same principle, with the heaviest equipment being stored below deck to ensure greater ship stability. The next step in the fight for buoyancy comes with the design of the ship's hull. This proved an item of controversy in recent years with the new Zumwalt-class destroyer. Many people feared that the USS Zumwalt's unusual tumble-home hull design would make it less capable of handling rough waters. However, the opposite appears to be the case. 
Veteran crew members have said that the Zumwalt actually handles rough seas better than the traditional ships they had also served on. In March 2019, the Zumwalt was traveling to Alaska in treacherous seas, with winds between 22 and 27 knots, 25 to 31 miles per hour, and waves between 9 and 13 feet. Although these were not the extreme hurricane conditions that have led to the worst disasters at sea, such weather provides an unpleasant traveling experience even on ships much larger than the Zumwalt. Though the ship was traveling in such conditions, which sailors call Sea State 6, the ship's commanding officer at the time, Captain Andrew Carlson, mentioned that it felt like Sea State 3 on board, which corresponds to waves of only 2 to 3 feet. The Zumwalt's tumble home hull widens while nearing the water, with the edge of the water being longer at the ship's bow than on its main deck. The Zumwalt's design was mainly executed with stealth in mind, but some architects worried that it would come at the cost of making the ship less stable. In 2015, Ken Brower, a well-regarded civilian naval architect, warned that the Zumwalt would collapse in a following sea if it was moving at the wrong speed and hit by the right type of wave at the right angle. Nine years later, this does not appear to be the case. Most US Navy ships have a more traditional U-shaped hull designed to resist drag or tilting in rough waters. The United States Nimitz and Ford-class carriers have V-shaped hulls that can cut through big waves. The US Navy's Nimitz-class carriers in particular have a tendency to list to starboard while under combat load conditions. To compensate for this, they have a freshwater ballast system in several of the inner bottom voids and damage control voids. Ballast systems have been in use since ancient times. Early ships would use solid materials like sandbags, rocks, or even roof tiles. However, from the 1880s, ship began to use liquid ballast systems. All ships have a ballast system, and their importance can be deduced by knowing what would happen if a ship does not have such a tool. Without ballast tanks, modern ships may see their propellers not fully immerse themselves in the water, list or trim if they are carrying less than full cargo, suffer stress on the ship's structure, and have transversal and longitudinal instability. The Nimitz-class carriers have freshwater ballast tanks in several inner bottom and damage control voids. By controlling the balance of water in these tanks, the carrier's crew members can raise or lower their vessel's center of gravity and ensure buoyancy. The USS Gerald R. Ford takes a different approach from the typical ship, including its Nimitz-class predecessors. The Ford uses a ballast system known as Permaballast, which is produced by a company called Ballast Technologies Incorporated. This product is a solid fixed ballast that is pumpable and has been in use since the 1980s. The material is made of inert composite solids of a proprietary primary material mixed with water. The company claims that the product does not contain chemical binders, making it environmentally safe and easily removable. Permaballast is installed as a thick slurry or paste. This system has not only seen use on the Ford either, it's also seen use on the US Navy's Arleigh Burke-class guided missile destroyers. The US Navy uses it on military sea lift vessels too. Some frigates in New Zealand's Navy and assault ships in the Australian Navy also use the permaballast material. But hull design and ballast systems are far from the only methods that the US Navy and many other ships besides have in place to ensure that vessels can stay at sea during storms and huge waves. Other technologies are put into play. One of them involves specialized fin stabilizers. Fin stabilizers help modern ships maintain balance in the constantly churning oceans. These pieces of equipment, located at the bottom of a ship's hull, provide resistance to the forces pushing on the ship at sea and prevent it from rolling too heavily to the left or right, thus preventing it from capsizing. Because fin stabilizers are built near the bottom of a ship's hull, most people don't see them. They are often only visible when a ship goes into dry dock. For ships of the US and other navies, fin stabilizers are even more important as they provide the platform stability which is critical in carrying out missions. Imagine an aircraft carrier rolling too heavily to the left or right on encountering rough seas, for example. In such circumstances, it would be impossible for the carrier to launch its planes. Similarly, ship stability is critical for other ships to launch their missiles or fire their guns. Without fin stabilizers, the US or other navies would be hard-pressed to carry out their missions unless the seas are calm. However, since calmer seas are closer to land, this would limit one of a modern navy's strongest attributes, the ability to strike a target on land from hundreds or thousands of miles away. Thanks to fin stabilizers, carriers can launch their planes and other ships can launch their missiles in almost any type of weather condition. There are two fin stabilizers on a modern ship, one to port and one to starboard. 
Each of the fin stabilizers has its special designated room from which it's controlled and operated. There is a fin box in each of these rooms which contains the fin and the machinery needed to control it. Standard ships come with stabilizing fins that can be raised or lowered by 25 degrees. The stabilizing fins can be remotely operated from the ship's bridge. Additionally, ships of the US Navy and most other modern ships come with gyroscopic stabilizers. These consist of spinning, vacuum-enclosed spheres mounted in a gimbal frame. These frames are then attached to special locations on a ship, usually in the engine room. These spheres, which maintain rotational motion, create angular momentum which combines with the ship's rolling motion. The combination of these two forces produces a leveling torque that keeps the ship stabilized and requires no further human intervention to work properly. Computer systems on the ship's bridge can adjust the tilt of the gyroscopic stabilizers as weather conditions require. Smaller ships can also, to an extent, self-correct if they capsize. They have angled hulls, weighted keels, or specialized ballasts that provide corrective movements should the vessel roll past a certain angle. These ship's computers are smart enough to understand when to make corrections and activate ballast pumps to ship water between the tanks. This will provide a stabilizing force to correct the ship's tilt and keep it upright. The Navy's aircraft carriers are far too large for this kind of technology, but smaller coastal vessels and inflatable craft have these features. Coast Guard ships often have them as well. Naval engineers continue to develop technology to improve their craft and reduce risk to the ship. They are increasingly choosing to use composite materials to reduce the ship's weight and better prevent corrosion. It's also certain that artificial intelligence will be developed to better monitor and predict weather patterns and prioritize important information for presentation to a ship's crew. In a scenario that might make some science fiction fans worry, it's also possible that AI will make certain decisions on navigation and ship stabilization automatically so that human crews can direct their attention to the most urgent tasks. Through machine learning, these AI programs will get better at recognizing potentially adverse conditions and responding to them more quickly. Technology might get the most attention, but having the proper personnel to operate and maintain it is just as critical. Because the US Navy has a global mission, it's critical to keep a significant number of ships at sea at any given time. These ships must travel thousands of miles and stay at sea for months on end, with the necessity to carry out tasks and missions at any time. This is why US Navy sailors are carefully trained to maintain their vessels. There are three main categories for maintenance tasks in the US Navy – preventative, corrective, and overhaul. As the name implies, sailors assigned to preventative maintenance are tasked with upkeep of the ship's structure and equipment so that problems do not show up in the first place. Preventative tasks include routine inspections, lubrication of the ship's machinery, and routine tests of equipment. Corrective maintenance tasks, also as the name implies, are for when problems show up in a ship's operation. Damaged or malfunctioning equipment must be repaired with speed to keep the ship at sea, since each vessel depends on its gear working properly. As we've seen, the failure of even one critical piece of equipment can mean danger for the entire ship and crew, especially in rough weather conditions. For example, fixing the frequent problems on the Navy's littoral combat ships such as engine troubles fall under corrective maintenance. While being able to perform corrective maintenance is an essential part of a sailor's duty, this work can sometimes be filthy, especially on a ship that's not well designed. For example, in July 2016, the USS Freedom LCS suffered a leak in its machinery room. Water mixed with oil to create a sludge that went through one of the four engines on board. Sailors had to clean this mess up in corrective maintenance. Finally, there is overhaul maintenance, a much more comprehensive category than either of the other two. Overhaul maintenance involves putting a ship into dry dock so that the hull is fully exposed and out of the water. In dry dock, sailors and civilian contractors can perform upkeep on equipment that's typically not visible, such as the ship's rudders and propellers. Those tasked to do overhaul maintenance on a ship can take entire systems apart, repair them, and put them back together. The troubles on board the USS Freedom can be taken as an example. An inspection of the ship after its participation in the 2016 Rim of Pacific RIMPAC, revealed that salt water had leaked into the engines and corroded them. The USS Freedom needed to be put into dry dock and repaired for two years' worth of overhaul maintenance. Navy sailors and civilian navigators are not only trained to do maintenance, however. They are trained and retrained to respond to emergencies. Drills would include engine room fire and flood exercises, oil spill drills, and blackout training drills, which include response procedures should a ship lose power. 
In the latter scenario, a ship is at the mercy of the weather. Since it has no force to counter the wind and current, sailors must restore power to the ship to prevent a disaster. The US Navy also has abandoned ship drills and survivability training should the worst-case scenario happen. In the latter drill, crews will train on how to jump into the ocean from the deck of a ship, prepare lifeboats, life jackets, and the necessary survival equipment should they need to resort to such measures. Less dramatically, sailors also participate in frequent drills designed to rescue crew members who have fallen into the sea by accident. Virtual reality training is also taking off in the US Navy and among its allies. For example, the Royal Navy is using virtual reality simulators to recreate a variety of its vessels. These simulators allow crew members to familiarize themselves with a ship's structure and tasks so that decision-making in the real world can happen more easily and rapidly. The world of navigation has come a long way from the age of sail, where unpredictable weather and wind or muscle-based propulsion meant frequent shipwrecks. Such things may seem like a thing of the past. However, the incidents with the El Faro and HTMS Shukatai revealed that Mother Nature will always find ways to wreck the best-laid human plans and engineering. What potential flaws do you think might still be present in the Navy's ships, past or future? What other advances do you suspect might be on the horizon in humanity's constant race for mastery over Mother Nature? Don't forget to let us know in the comments. Also, please make sure to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel for more military analysis from military experts. Carrier strike groups are the quintessential tool of American power projection worldwide, with over 5,000 sailors and airmen attached to five ships sporting dozens of aircraft and hundreds of missiles, these formations alone are more powerful than most countries' entire air force combined. The aircraft carrier is the heart of all this weaponry. Without it, the carrier strike group loses a huge part of its offensive capability and command and control. Because of this, adversaries of the United States have been developing a series of weapons known as carrier killers. Whether these are a new hypersonic ballistic missile or some state-of-the-art powerful torpedo, countries like Russia and China have been claiming for years to have finally built weapon systems capable of knocking out a carrier. But despite these claims, these weapons remain untested. However, if a war really were to kick off, it is not unlikely that adversaries might use any kind of weapon in a peer-to-peer -peer conflict, including nuclear weapons. So what if a nuclear device was deployed against an aircraft carrier instead of a missile or torpedo? How would it survive? Fortunately for the several thousand men and women that call an aircraft carrier their home, they have a vast array of tools at their disposal to help them to survive such an attack. The first of such tools is not even on their ship, but on the escorts in the strike group. In the event of an actual situation where the enemy could deploy a nuclear weapon, US intelligence probably has indications and warnings that such an attack is imminent. As a result, the intelligence community can feed this information to the strike group. The destroyers and cruiser of the unit can then be on the lookout for missiles and aircraft that fit the target profile. Because these ships are equipped with the Aegis self-defense system, they could shoot down an incoming plane or missile from unbelievably long distances with stunning accuracy. However, if the nuclear attack was a surprise or deployed from a platform that the various units' spy radar could not pick up, then the carrier is in for a rude awakening. Unless the aircraft carrier sees or knows the detonation has occurred, the enemy may catch it off guard. This is because, unlike chemical and biological agents, the ship does not have early warning of radiological contamination. For chemical and biological agents, the carrier is equipped with an integrated point detection system and a joint biological point detection system, respectively. All of the US military branches joined forces in the 1990s and worked on a reliable way to detect these types of agents. What resulted was a system that could test for some of the world's most common chemical and biological agents. If one or both of these systems detects a dangerous substance, a loud alarm is set off throughout the ship. While no such system exists for radiological contaminants, because of a nuclear weapon's nature, the ship will more than likely have received a prior warning and could start taking immediate action to protect the ship. A carrier's first action would likely be to set general quarters, or GQ. When sailors hear the distinctive, repetitive bong on the 1MC, the central announcing system, they know it's time to spring into action. Why the ship would go into GQ for a nuclear attack is twofold. First, a nuclear blast is likely to cause a tremendous amount of damage to the ship. Even the shockwave can cause things like ruptured pipes, loss of power, cracked bulkheads, and other damage. Second, the nuclear strike could be part of a bigger, more coordinated attack, 
and the ship would still need to be ready to defend itself from other conventional forces like aircraft or submarines. Because of this, those sailors not busy maintaining the ship's integrity are preparing to protect it from follow-on attacks. Once the CO calls away GQ, the first action the ship's repair lockers will take will be to set the right material condition of the ship. All Navy ships have different readiness conditions based upon the type of threat faced. In port, the ship could be in a less restrictive condition like yoke, where many hatches and scuttles are left open. For material condition Zebra, the most restrictive, every door, hatch, scuttle, and valve on the ship is shut to prevent cascading casualties. But for a nuclear attack, sailors would set something called Circle William. For Circle William to be set right, all of the fittings that connect to the outside will be closed. Any pipe, ventilation intake, or door that leads to the weather decks is secured. Perhaps the most critical aspect is ensuring that the collective protection system zones are correctly set. The collective protection system, or CPS, is the system on board Navy vessels that keeps the ship pressurized to prevent foul air from coming inside. Each ship is divided into CPS zones, and the carrier is no different. By keeping positive control of CPS, sailors can ensure that even if contaminated air comes in through a Circle William fitting, the pressure difference will prevent the radiation from spreading far. But of course, the ship cannot prevent all air from coming inside. After all, various systems on board need to draw in air from the outside to function. To solve this problem, the Navy created a unique method of filtering air when the ship has to operate in a nuclear environment. For systems that need to draw in outside air, they put it through massive fan rooms. These fan rooms are split between a clean side and a dirty side. The dirty side is where the pressure differential sucks the air into the room, and the clean side is where the filtration happens. Here, massive charcoal filters clean the highly pressurized air of contaminants before it gets introduced into the CPS system. Even though the air filtration and CPS systems are powerful, massive amounts of nuclear fallout material or radiated water will put the ship in a terrible spot. To prevent this, the ship has another external system called countermeasure washdown. Countermeasure washdown is essentially a giant sprinkler system, and it is fed through the ship's fire main loop that draws in seawater through sea chests on the bottom of the ship. The system is also split into multiple zones, with what looks like sprinkler heads spread throughout the ship's weather decks. When activated, countermeasure washdown sprays pressurized seawater all over the deck to keep the deck wet. By keeping it moist, contaminants are far less likely to stick to the deck and cause problems. If a nuclear attack occurs, the commanding officer can choose to use the system continuously or intermittently, depending on the commanding officer's discretion. For the individual sailors, they too have their own protection system, known as the Mission Orientated Protective Posture Suit. These plastic suits look similar to what US troops wore during the first Gulf War. The suit is composed of a pair of pants, overcoat, gloves, and shoes a sailor can place their boots into. The most important part of the suit is the mask. Before going on deployment, every sailor is individually fitted for their mask. The Navy does this because if the mask does not fit perfectly to a sailor's face, it's useless since even the smallest gap can allow deadly toxins into the suit. In a nuclear attack, all personnel would receive their gear. You might be thinking that sailors trying to get gear while the ship is actively engaged makes no sense, and you'd be right. In a real-world situation, the Navy has different levels of mop protection. At the least restrictive level, ships need to have enough masks and suits for everyone on board. As the likelihood of an attack increases, the carrier can elevate the mop posture, which could include actions such as preemptively spraying countermeasure washdown and issuing masks and suits to everyone who would then be required to keep them on station. In the worst-case scenario where a nuclear attack is unexpected, waiting in line to receive mop suits and masks would be a serious problem. For this reason, the Navy is forward-leaning in getting equipment on station early. Another part of the individual kit for a nuclear attack is known as a dosimeter. A dosimeter looks like a little watch that sailors merely slip on their wrist. The device measures radiation, and if it's too high, it makes a beeping sound alerting the sailor to move and seek medical attention. But if a sailor gets exposed to too much radiation either inside or outside the ship, they do have an option. They can go through a decontamination station to purge themselves of outside radiation. Every ship has decontamination stations and the carrier is no different. Potentially contaminated sailors will make their way to their outer clothing undressing area and an attendant in a full mop suit will help cut off their contaminated mop suits and boots while keeping their mask on their faces. When directed, the sailor then heads into the inner clothing undressing area. Here, a sailor strips off all their clothes and gets a highly pressurized, cold shower from openings all around the space. Once showered, the sailor then steps into the air purge compartment and, after this step, is allowed inside the skin of the ship. However, the ordeal is not over just yet. Once a sailor steps outside, a corpsman is standing by with fresh clothes, 
and a damage controlman is waiting to measure the sailor's radiation with a radiac. A radiac is the only portable radiation measuring device the carrier will have. The DC man needs to ensure that the sailor has acceptable radiation levels. If not, they are taken to a secure area of the ship by a master at arms or MA. The MA is armed with a pistol and may use deadly force to stop a sailor from running around the ship if they get freaked out when learning that they are now severely radiated. The Navy takes this precaution because the crew does not know what is causing the radiation on the sailor. In the eyes of the Navy, it is better to lose one life than risk the whole crew, but of course this is only a last resort. Those that are radiated that behave calmly are taken to isolation for further evaluation. Those sailors who are busy fighting the ship face a grim existence while at GQ for a nuclear attack. Because they risk contamination if they take off their suits, sailors are required to keep them on at all times. The masks have a hole to put a straw through for drinking, and sailors may remove them only to eat. Luxuries like toilets, showers, and fresh food are secured to save water because the ship cannot purify water contaminated with radiation. What water was left on the ship when the attack happened is what the ship has, and water usage for anything but drinking is strictly prohibited. Not only would sailors have to find inventive ways to use the bathroom, but they would have to sleep on station with their suits on and eat only MREs. Because of all these restrictions, a carrier would only have a short amount of time to keep this up and the commanding officer would be trying to get as far away from Ground Zero quickly for crew endurance. Even with all these protective measures, that still may not be enough. If radiation does get into the ship at dangerous levels, or the ship has suffered such severe damage to not allow meaningful damage control efforts, the carrier's commanding officer has one last thing they can do to save as many lives as possible. Every class of ship and carrier is different, but the fact remains that on each one, there are portions of the ship known as deep shelter. Deep shelter places are so low down and easily secured that they can reliably keep sailors safe even if the integrity of the ship is compromised. The only downside to this last resort is that ships have only a minimal number of spaces that can classify as deep shelter and do not have enough room for the whole crew. Those sailors and the captain that remain in place controlling stations like the bridge, combat information center, and central control station are likely to suffer death or serious bodily harm from exposure. If the situation is so bad that it has gotten to this point, the captain's only concern now is saving as much of the crew as possible and getting out of the area. It is a sacrifice that the commanding officer must make. It's lightweight. It's small enough to be deployed in urban environments. It's armed with a powerful 105mm cannon and a highly accurate targeting system. And it is not a tank. So what is it? What has the US military spent over $1 billion developing in recent years? The death of the tank has been a theme in many military circles for the past decade or so. With fighting increasingly moving to tight urban environments, the ubiquity of precision airstrikes and artillery, the increasing potency of portable anti-tank weapons like the Javelin and Enlor, and the growing presence of easy-to-use missile and kamikaze drones, many military experts have questioned the staying power of the main battle tank. Case in point, Traditional tank versus tank combat has been rare in Ukraine. To further complicate matters, Russian tanks have all too often proven easy pickings for their Ukrainian enemies armed with portable anti-tank weapons or drones. Yet, the idea of the death of the tank is also an exaggeration, despite all these advances in technology. Even as traditional tank duels wane, tanks and other armored fighting vehicles remain useful for storming positions and supporting infantry attacks which is why they have proven an important part of the war in Ukraine, even as their traditional role has diminished. How is the United States Army adapting to the changing nature of armored warfare? In June 2023, the Pentagon revealed some of the answers when it unveiled its first new tracked armored vehicle in four decades, the M10 Booker. The new vehicle is named after two soldiers, Robert D. Booker, who died in World War II, and Stephen A. Booker, who died in the invasion of Iraq in 2003. Private Robert D. Booker fought on the North African front. On April 19, 1943, he used his machine gun to destroy a German machine gun nest. He then advanced over hundreds of yards of open territory, making himself a target for enemy small arms and artillery fire as he guided his comrades' advance. Despite fatal wounds, he continued to do this until he expired. He was posthumously awarded the Medal of Honor for his action. Staff Sergeant Stephen Booker was in command of an armored task force during Operation Iraqi Freedom during the Thunder Run into Baghdad. On April 5, 2003, in an attack on Baghdad's airport, his tank unit came under RPG and small arms fire by Iraqi forces. 
The machine gun on Booker's Abrams tank failed, however, so the sergeant exited the vehicle and got in a prone position on the turret, engaging enemy forces with his personal weapon and directing fire at the enemy. He destroyed one Iraqi vehicle in the process and protected his troops' flank from enemy attacks until he was killed in his daring action. For his deeds, Staff Sergeant Booker was posthumously awarded the Distinguished Service Cross, the United States Army's second-highest commendation. These soldiers' actions were the inspiration for the M10 Booker, whose task is, according to the Army Brass, to be an infantry assault vehicle that brings a new level of lethality to our ground forces and allows our men and women in uniform an advanced level of protection. The new armored vehicle is a more compact version of the M1 Abrams tank and bridges the gap between it and the Army's M1126 Striker infantry carrier vehicle. It will be more deployable than the Abrams and carry more firepower than lighter armored vehicles to give infantry units more options for protected fire support. While the Booker is not the first Army vehicle to be named after two soldiers, the Striker also is. Staff Sergeant Devon Booker is the first post-9-11 soldier to get such an honor. The first M10 Bookers are expected to arrive in the US Army's ranks by the end of 2023. Initial operations testing at a battalion level will be held in late 2024 or early 2025. The Army's goal is to eventually integrate battalions of Bookers into its light infantry brigade combat teams, which include airborne units. With a weight of nearly 42 tons, the vehicle is too heavy to be airdropped, but can be transported via a C-17 making it easier to get to hotspots than the M1 Abrams. The M10 Booker, produced by General Dynamics Land Systems, is the winner of the Army's Mobile Protected Firepower program, which began in 2015 and was described as a high priority for the Pentagon. In June 2022, the Defense Department announced that the General Dynamics design for the program won out over its competitor from BAE Systems. The Mobile Protected Firepower program was meant to better integrate armor with infantry, as the M1 Abrams' main battle tank is not as easily deployable. It weighs so much that it usually needs to be transported by ship, which can take weeks. One Abrams can fit inside a C-17 if need be, but only one. In contrast, the Mobile Protected Firepower program wanted to create a more rapidly deployable armored vehicle that could easily project power with infantry or airborne forces. This is why the Army is not calling the M10 Booker a tank or a light tank. And though this may seem an insignificant distinction, the Army is serious about avoiding this term when it comes to the new vehicle. To understand why, it's best to go over a little history. Light tanks made their debut before World War II, primarily serving in scouting roles. They were designed to withstand small arms fire from infantry, but not to go up against enemy tanks because they would always be outgunned. However, the development of effective portable anti-armor weapons, such as the rocket-propelled grenade, ensured that their usefulness on the battlefield had ended, even in a reconnaissance role. The M10 Booker does not resemble a light tank, but it also does not resemble a main battle tank. Instead, the Army is using a completely different term to describe its purpose – mobile protected firepower. The Booker may have been in part inspired by a World War II-era vehicle called the M10 Wolverine, the first in the US Army to get the M10 designation. This vehicle had a 76mm main gun, and was meant to provide quick, reactive, anti-tank firepower. However, it was primarily defensive in nature and more lightly armored than its M10 successor. The Booker is a much more offensive-minded weapons platform. The M10 Booker is not designed to fight battles against enemy tanks. Even so, the vehicle is similar enough to the Abrams that crews for that tank would need to only do short, transitional training to be ready to operate the Booker. In June 2023 at Fort Belvoir, Virginia, the Booker was officially unveiled to the public, and the Army awarded General Dynamics, the same contractor that builds the Abrams, a $1.14 billion contract to build and deploy the first 96 vehicles. They are expected to reach their units by the end of fiscal year 2025. This contract was later extended to add 26 more M10 Bookers, and bumped the total price tag to $1.34 billion. Each individual Booker should cost about $13 million, the Army says that this will be less expensive than the cost of the modern M1A2 Abrams tank. The Army plans on purchasing a total of 504 M10 Bookers by 2035. The M10 Booker's primary weapon is a 105mm gun. This is smaller than the 120mm main gun on the Abrams, but much more powerful than the 25mm gun on the M2 Bradley. 
The Booker's main cannon will come with enough punch to destroy enemy armored vehicles, presumably things like Russia's BMPT Terminator. The gun is also capable of knocking out bunkers and other fixed fortifications. The turret is flexible, and if the need arises, the main gun can be swapped with something even heavier. The Booker's armaments will include the armor-piercing discarding Sabot round, which is a spin-stabilized kinetic energy projectile designed to punch through thick enemy armor. The Booker will also come packed with high explosive rounds for other missions, like clearing buildings, bunkers, or trench networks. That may not be the limit, as the main cannon is compatible with a broad spectrum of currently fielded munitions that can achieve lethal effects against a variety of targets. According to the Fiscal Year 2022 Director, Operational Test and Evaluation Report, the Booker's main gun will be loaded manually. It's worth noting that despite its assignment to avoid combat with enemy armor, the Booker's 105mm main gun is still powerful enough to damage or destroy most of Russia's main battle tanks. The Booker's secondary armaments will be a 50 caliber M2 Browning machine gun mounted on the commander hatch and a 7.62mm M240B machine gun mounted coaxially. The Booker's targeting system will be advanced, with a laser range finder and computer that can calculate where the crew should fire the gun to hit the target. These calculations will include compensation for a moving target or if the host Booker is moving. The fire control system is similar to that seen in the M1A2 Abrams, again proving the point of interoperability between the two units. Like the Abrams, the Booker will come with a crew of four. The commander will have an independent thermal viewer that can provide information from multiple directions. This is the Safran Optics 1's Paceo Commander's Independent Tactical Viewer CITV, long-range panoramic targeting site. The M10's targeting system could also be getting an AI upgrade in the near future. Doug Bush, the Assistant Secretary of the Army for Acquisition, Technology and Logistics, said of the possibility, over time, of course. The potential use of AI and targeting assistance, assisting the crew, you know, to sort data from advanced sensors, is something the Army is of course thinking about. And that's something that this vehicle down the road sure could perhaps benefit from that kind of technology. As it stands, that was not a requirement of course up front. But sure, potentially as the sensors and the computing power necessary to do that gets smaller, they could over time make their way into vehicles of this class. I think that's fair to say where we're thinking about it. In the near future, AI could help the Booker's crew sort and prioritize targets, although Bush was adamant that the Booker is not designed to be a fully automated vehicle now or in the future, and that human crews will always be the ones making the decision to pull the trigger. The Booker's tracks give it superior performance in rough terrain compared to other infantry supporting armored vehicles like the Humvee. The M10's tracked wheels are more efficient than other vehicles like it too, as they are lighter in weight giving it more speed and maneuverability. Its maximum cruising speed will be 65 km per hour with a range of 305 km. The M10 Booker will also be able to go in places that the Abrams cannot go. For example, the Abrams is too heavy to cross some bridges. But because the Booker is only about half as heavy, it will be able to traverse those pieces of infrastructure, a feature in line with its mission for ease of deployment. As for deployment worldwide, two Bookers can fit inside a C-17, making these units much easier to deliver than their older, heavier brother. They will be able to deploy faster and further, making them ideal for rapid response to emerging situations. The Booker's design for ease of deployment means that it will be able to go almost anywhere that infantry goes. Urban combat would be a heavy emphasis. As more people are moving into cities, more fighting is also taking place in cities, a trend which will accelerate as the century goes on. Supporting infantry in urban combat will therefore be one of the Booker's primary missions now and in the foreseeable future. Infantry, in turn, can support the Booker. Urban combat in Iraq taught the United States the importance of integrating armor with dismounted infantry. In such an environment, infantry can move around in the tight quarters, spot priority targets, and relay that information back to the Booker, which can then maneuver into position far more easily than an Abrams would in such a setting. From there, the Booker's weapons would open up and clear the targets. The Booker is versatile in other types of terrain. It can navigate steeper hills than other vehicles. It can also move across valleys and cross rivers, giving it access to hotspots that the Abrams would find much more difficult to reach. Since ancient times, armor has always been a trade-off between mobility and protection, and that was certainly the case with the M10 Booker. Because it's lighter and more mobile than the Abrams, 
it's not as well protected by armor. Even so, it's a fairly durable vehicle, far more so than something like the M2 Bradley. The Booker's armor can hold its own against 30mm armor-piercing discarding Sabot rounds from the front. Meanwhile, the vehicle can withstand 14.5mm armor-piercing rounds on its sides. The Booker comes with explosive reactive armor panels, which disrupt common enemy anti-tank weapons like RPGs, preventing them from impacting the main vehicle chassis. There are also measures in place under the vehicle to protect against mines and improvised explosive devices. The engine's placement at the front of the vehicle can also provide additional protection. For example, if the vehicle were hit from the front, the projectile would not directly impact the crew compartment, giving the Booker's operators more survivability. This is in contrast to the Abrams, which has its engine at the back and invests heavily in armor at the front. Like the Abrams, the M10 Booker has a compartmentalized ammunition magazine, a feature designed to insulate the crew should the ammunition explode. The lack of this feature is one of the reasons why so many Russian tanks have been blown skyward in Ukraine in jack-in-the-box style explosions. The Booker is also well protected from above. Its turret is designed to withstand hits from anti-tank missiles and loitering drones. Drones that can perform reconnaissance missions in the air for a while but also dive on targets and blow themselves up. However, because of its lighter armor, the M10 Booker's job is not to get into direct firefights with the enemy. Another reason why the Army Brass adamantly insists that it's not a tank. Instead, the Booker is designed to stay behind the infantry and beyond the range of enemy direct fire weapons. From this position, the new vehicle will provide the frontline forces with fire support. If it needs to go into position to destroy a bunker or trench fortification, for example, it will do so, then retreat behind the advancing infantry. The Booker's crew would be in constant communication with their infantry comrades relying on them to direct it to safe routes free and clear of anti-tank threats. The M10 Booker also comes with smoke grenade launchers to enhance its concealability. The Booker will have less fuel requirements than the Abrams. Its 800 horsepower diesel engine can last for 24 hours, and the Booker will consume much less fuel if it's turned on but not in action, in contrast to the Abrams, which burns 12 gallons of fuel per hour even when idling. The engine itself is a Rolls-Royce MTU 8V199 power pack. 96 of these engines are on schedule for the low-rate initial production phase of the M10 Booker program. More engines will be delivered as the program moves into its broader production phases. It's the first time that the MTU serial production engine has been used to power a vehicle in the US Army's land defense program, according to Scott Hansen, the defense director for Rolls-Royce Solutions America, the American subsidiary of Rolls-Royce Power Systems. These six- and eight-cylinder engines are compact and come with high power. Despite promising signs, there have been a few issues with the Booker that will need to be resolved before the Army fields it. Early tests discovered elevated levels of toxic fumes when firing the main gun. The gun sent these toxic fumes into the main cabin of the tank. In early 2023, the Army explained that it was adding a purge system to clear the fumes from the crew area. By June, when the Booker was unveiled to the public, the Army announced that it had successfully fixed the issue. The M10 Booker's cooling system also needs to be improved so that the vehicle will need less maintenance and manage heat better, as it became overheated in initial tests under hot climate conditions. The Army said it would be working on a more efficient heat exchange, better cooling shroud, and larger fan and supply pump for the vehicle to overcome these challenges. Again in June 2023, the Army announced that the issue had been fixed saying that the Booker would be able to meet all of its performance requirements in high temperatures. The Army is also researching ways to make the M10 Booker quieter. This is important because stealth is one of the advantages of infantry, but adding something like the Booker to infantry units will naturally make them noisier and easier to detect. Infantry units will also need to carry the capability to repair the Bookers on the fly. When commenting for an article in military.com, Captain Matthew Adkins, who served as an infantry officer with the 10th Mountain Division in Afghanistan, said that anything mechanized will always break down or roll over in combat, and so having the maintenance capability nearby would be critical for the Booker to do its job. Despite these concerns, veterans of the Iraq and Afghanistan wars are generally optimistic about the new vehicle's place in the Army. Retired Brigadier General Andrew Hilmes, an officer who was stationed only two tanks behind Staff Sergeant Booker on that day in Iraq, said that the new M10 would, when properly employed, help light formations rapidly mass combat power, penetrate a prepared defense, and harden themselves when performing security operations. 
Like many new systems in the United States Armed Forces, the M10 Booker is being designed with the idea of open architecture in mind. Because of this, it will be able to accommodate future upgrades based on the changing nature of its operational needs. Although this sounds modern, something similar has been at work with the Abrams, which was one of the reasons why its basic design has stayed around for over 40 years. The M1A1 and M1A2 Abrams are vastly different from the original M1 Abrams. An all-new main gun and turret is just one of the upgrades that came when the M1 was upgraded to the M1A1, demonstrating just how flexible these armored vehicles can be. It's too early to tell how the M10 Booker will change, although it's being installed with AI-assisted fire control systems and anti-drone capabilities at some point is probably a good bet. Either way, the M10 Booker's open architecture design should make it an important part of the US Army's ability to fight and project power across all terrains for decades to come. But what do you think about the Army's newest tracked armored vehicle? Will the M10 Booker prove to be as important a game-changer for infantry support as the Pentagon is claiming? Is it, in fact, a light tank, despite the US Army's officers repeatedly saying that it's not? Don't forget to let us know in the comment section below the video. Also, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. The B-2 Spirit Stealth Bomber completely redefined the concept of air superiority. It was so far ahead of its game that it's never even been detected or targeted by an enemy weapon system during any of its missions. Why was this aircraft so ahead of its time, and what made it so dominant? How did this aircraft, which is nearly invisible on radar and is able to carry a payload that could level most countries, seemingly appear out of nowhere? From top-secret research to classified materials, we'll unravel what made the B-2 bomber light years ahead of its time. The B-2 can actually trace its roots back to Nazi Germany. The Horton brothers had already conceived a concept which gives the B-2 its almost otherworldly design, the flying wing. The Horton 229 was able to achieve a speed of 500 miles per hour far faster than anything else in the skies during World War II. Luftwaffe head Hermann Göring called for a lightweight bomber to help offset the growing fuel consumption demands of a multi-front war. Testing was nearing completion in early 1945, but as the war had turned overwhelmingly against them, the Germans were never able to field the plane. While the Horton brothers made significant advances in the flying wing design, an American named Jack Northrop was making strides of his own. When the war ended, Northrop was convinced that where the Germans had failed, he could succeed in creating the ultimate bomber. In the initiation of Operation Paperclip, an effort by America to acquire all of the advanced technological assets from the dissolved Nazi regime, many of the secrets of the flying wing aircraft made their way over the Atlantic. Northrop continued to pursue his dream of building the flying wing aircraft, until his first major successful prototype came in the way of the YB-49. The YB-49 could fly up to 500 miles per hour with a ceiling of 40,000 feet, but Northrop's dreams would face a major setback when, due to the difficulty in controlling the aircraft and its instability during flight, the US government ordered all of the aircraft to be destroyed. This decision would come to haunt them, however, as the Soviet Union was stockpiling even more advanced weapons, particularly air defense missiles. The US government needed a bomber that could penetrate Soviet airspace without being a sitting duck for Soviet air defenses. Air defense systems rely on an array of radars that detect incoming enemy aircraft so that fighters and anti-aircraft missile batteries can be activated. For much of the Cold War, the US relied on its fleet of B-52 Strata Fortresses. While a very competent bomber on its own, the B-52 was becoming more and more vulnerable to Soviet ground-to-air missiles that could reach higher and higher altitudes. These air defense systems identify an aircraft by its radar signature. A radar signature is the feedback a specific object returns to a radar display due to its radar cross-section. Typical aircraft have a large radar cross-section when compared to other atmospheric objects like birds. With the B-52 having a huge radar cross-section due to its size, the top US military brass wanted a solution, and they wanted it fast. The 1970s saw a returned interest to developing bombers which could penetrate enemy airspace without detection, and DARPA requested that the top aeronautics firms in the US provide it with its best concepts. Lockheed Martin had a leg up here, having recently developed the incredibly complex and advanced SR-71, which had a number of stealth features. Lockheed was given a small contract to pursue the area further and develop the initial concept in the hopeless diamond model. This early model would eventually be developed into the stealth fighter we all recognize today, the F-117. The F-117 is considered a stealth aircraft but has features that would later be improved upon, such as the rigid angular outer paneling. There was not advanced enough computer modeling at the time to create the complex sloped surfaces seen on the B-2. 
The technology developed during these secretive programs would lay the groundwork for the B-2 spirit. With the election of President Ronald Reagan came an influx of vigor for developing advanced military hardware, and stealth tech was at the top of his list. The ATB or Advanced Technology Bomber Program, which had begun under the Carter administration in 1979, was ramped up and given a much larger budget. The flying wing design from Northrop and advances in stealth tech accomplished by Lockheed and DARPA were on course to create one of the greatest aircrafts ever to grace the skies. The US government submitted a bidding competition for all the major domestic aircraft manufacturers to create a next-generation bomber capable of bypassing enemy radar detection. This was a technology which did not exist in full form, and many of these corporations were unable to produce a sufficient prototype. Somewhat ironically, Northrop was selected nearly 30 years after the aircraft had been destroyed by the government's orders. Work began on the design of the aircraft with the utmost secrecy under the Black Program. The workers were almost always out of uniform and subject to regular polygraph tests. Most of Congress was denied knowledge of what and how much money was being spent on the program. This was done to avoid the Soviets gaining any clues as to what was going on by examining U.S. budgetary documents and technical journals. The clock was ticking as they needed to develop this quickly before too many people started asking questions about the mounting expense of this mystery program. For the manufacturing, a former Ford automobile assembly plant in Pico Riviera, California was acquired and heavily rebuilt. The plant's employees were sworn to complete secrecy regarding their work. To avoid the possibility of suspicion, components were typically purchased through front companies and military officials would visit out of uniform. The secrecy extended so far that access to nearly all information on the program by both Government Accountability Offices or GAO and virtually all members of Congress itself was severely limited until the mid-1980s. Northrop was the B-2's prime contractor. Major subcontractors included Boeing, Hughes Aircraft, GE, and Vought Aircraft. An employee at this plant, Thomas Cavanaugh, was arrested and sentenced to life in prison for attempting to sell classified secrets about the program to the Soviets. The demand from the government was simple. Build a bomber that can never be spotted by radar. The endeavor to do so was anything but, and many thought it was simply impossible. To give a sense of the work required, Northrop had to acquire and construct some of the fastest and most efficient computer hardware on the planet to build a supercomputer capable of producing the 3D models needed to work on the design. They also needed to create a brand new software program to run those models, a first of this scale. The press was abuzz with the mystery surrounding the program, and many speculations began to circulate as to what was going on behind Northrop's doors. They finally got their answer on November 22, 1988. Everyone was awestruck by this new aircraft with its otherworldly, almost alien-looking design. The aircraft stunned military officials around the world and at home. The sloped structure of the aircraft paneling makes it seem to change shape when viewed from different angles. This has the effect of causing radar beams to be reflected off into the atmosphere or return in extremely small numbers, giving the bomber a similar radar cross-section to a bird. Former Air Force Chief of Staff General Larry Welch even claimed that the aircraft had a radar cross-section in the insect category. The aircraft is also coated in RAM, or radar-absorbent materials, which are highly classified but are generally known to contain a carbon-graphite composite material. The bomber is also equipped with advanced electronic warfare countermeasures capable of knocking out enemy radar positions. With its engines embedded inside the aircraft paneling and an advanced exhaust system which mixes the hot gas with the cold air in the atmosphere, the B-2 is almost invisible to heat-seeking missiles that might be lucky enough to be launched at it after it's detected. The loadout of the B-2 was astounding as well. The original loadout was up to 40,000 pounds of bombs, which could include up to 16 nuclear warheads. With its ability to penetrate any air defense systems without detection, and a payload able to knock out over a dozen major cities or military installations, the B-2 inspired fear all around the globe. Given that the B-2 came out only a couple of years before the Soviet Union fell, its need was eventually called into question, with an inflation-adjusted price of $1.2 billion in today's money. The fleet would have been wildly expensive. With an original order of 131 aircraft, it was now being asked if such a massive fleet of stealth, essentially nuclear bombers, was necessary. The original order was cut to only 21 aircraft. Even with this reduced number, the aircraft projects significant global power and has yet to see a rival come to challenge its supremacy as a stealth bomber. Even with all the fear that came with the power of the B-2, it had still not seen any real-life action until, by the authorization of NATO, the B-2 conducted its first sorties. During the Yugoslavian conflict, the aircraft was used to strike targets to halt the fighting, and during one of those missions an enemy MiG fighter was present beneath the aircraft, yet never realized it was present. The first real-life test showed that the B-2 had a place in the post-Cold War world. The aircraft also has the ability to conduct some of the longest missions ever attempted. 
With the aircraft being able to travel up to 6,000 miles without the need to refuel, this technological wonder can operate with its modest crew of two people completely on its own. One mission flew from their home base at Whiteman Air Force Base, Missouri, to the Indian Ocean without any stops. The pilots regularly conducted bombing missions in Iraq, Afghanistan, and many other targets in the Middle East from Missouri without landing anywhere. The same pilots would often rotate to complete flight missions well over 24 hours. With the help of air refueling operations, the aircraft could take off from Whiteman, drop bombs in the Middle East, and return to Whiteman without ever touching the ground. The current loadout of the B-2 is astounding. The bomber has seen significant upgrades over the years and can carry up to 80 JDAMs or Joint Direct Attack Munitions, which was upgraded from an original 16. Other conventional weapons in its arsenal include Mark 82-84 bombs, CBU-87 Combined Effects Munitions, Gator Mines, and the GBU-97 Sensor Fused Weapon. The B-2 is capable of carrying a massive 30,000-pound MOP or Massive Ordnance Penetrator, which can penetrate even the most heavily reinforced bunkers for deadly effect. Cruise missiles have also been added to its arsenal, and with nuclear-capable cruise missiles this allows for a standoff strike capability. A standoff strike capability means that the B-2 does not have to penetrate as far into enemy territory to deliver its conventional or nuclear ordnance carried via cruise missile. Accompanying this impressive loadout of weaponry is some of the most advanced avionics on the planet. The B-2 was once equipped with hundreds of standalone computers to accomplish various in-flight tasks, such as terrain mapping, flight data, and much more. These have been replaced by a single integrated avionics management computer, which gives pilots a higher degree of usability in flight. Much of these are integrated with advanced 1553B data bus communication lines and fiber optic lines. The aircraft is also EMP hardened, so in the event of a specific EMP attack or upper atmospheric nuclear weapon detonation, the B-2 can operate business as usual even while much of the country would be without power. The B-2 is also equipped with advanced in-flight communication equipment, including Link-16 and HF or high-frequency satellite links, so even well on their way to the enemy territory they can receive mission updates without enemy interception. Highly advanced onboard electronic warfare systems provide additional protection against enemy detection and targeting. With an ever-advancing payload and sensory array, the B-2 stealth bomber continues to stay one step ahead of the competition. This bomber still has global military scrambling to come up with an answer to the capabilities, and with the increase in standoff strike capabilities, the B-2 can continue to operate even if advanced detection methods are developed. The aircraft remains ahead of its time, but advancing global threats are challenging the aging titan for supremacy. The Department of Defense has commissioned the design and creation of the next step in stealth bomber evolution, the B-21 Raider. With the B-2 still reigning supreme, we can only imagine what its successor will bring to bear against her enemies. With all the advanced technology available worldwide, why do the highly developed US Navy SEALs still rely on a weapon that is 60 years old? As the old adage goes, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. While militaries are generally all about the latest, most effective battlefield technology, some weapons have truly stood the test of time. Among these is the M60 machine gun, which has a well-earned reputation in the annals of modern warfare, symbolizing both the technological advancements of the 20th century and the enduring legacy of firepower in military history. This formidable weapon, known colloquially as the pig due to its rapid rate of fire and appetite for ammunition, has been in service for nearly seven decades. It swiftly became a staple in the United States arsenal, playing a pivotal role in numerous conflicts. In the context of the Navy SEALs, the M60 also holds a special place. Despite the emergence of newer, more technologically advanced weapons, improved variants of the M60 continue to be utilized by the SEALs for specific operations. Its robustness, combined with the high volume of fire it can unleash, makes it an ideal weapon for certain tactical situations, particularly where sustained firepower is crucial. At the same time, it is lighter, better balanced, and easier to control than some other machine guns like the M240, all crucial factors for infantry. The small but continued use of the M60 by even such an elite unit as the SEALs underscores its enduring efficacy and reliability, even in an era dominated by rapid technological advancements in weaponry. Historically, the M60 was best known for its significant impact during the Vietnam War. Its ability to lay down heavy suppressive fire was crucial in numerous engagements, providing cover for troops and hindering enemy movements. The M60's versatility also allowed it to be mounted on vehicles, aircraft and boats, further extending its utility across different branches of the military. The genesis of this fearsome weapon can be tracked back to the 1950s. 
a period marked by intense innovation in arms technology during the early days of the Cold War, seeking to replace older models like the M1918 Browning Automatic Rifle BAR, and the M1919 Browning machine gun, the US military began development of a versatile, reliable, and effective weapon. The development of the M60 was influenced by the notable attributes of its predecessors, particularly the German MG42, renowned for its rapid fire rate, and the FG42, known for its lightness and accuracy. Incorporating these influential designs, the M60 was first introduced in 1957. It was designed as a general-purpose machine gun, embodying the dual role of a light infantry and a mounted weapon. This adaptability was a significant leap in firearm technology, offering the US military an innovative tool for various, more flexible combat scenarios. The M60 brought several technological advancements to the forefront. It was air-cooled, gas-operated, and featured a belt-fed system, allowing for sustained fire a critical factor in suppressing enemy forces. The machine gun fired the standard NATO 7.62x51mm cartridge, which was a step towards ammunition standardization among NATO allies. Despite weighing around 23 pounds, it was relatively light for a machine gun of its era, enhancing its portability. The M60 could fire up to 550 rounds per minute, a rate that provided substantial firepower in the hands of infantry units. Its design allowed for quick barrel replacement an essential feature in prolonged firefights, where overheating barrels were a concern. The M60's most notable deployment was in Vietnam. When the US entered the conflict, its soldiers were still using a combination of Brownings and M60s. The Browning guns remained either on vehicles or tripods mounted along a base's perimeter, while lighter M60s were used mostly for patrols. But the M60 quickly became a pivotal asset for US forces, providing crucial suppressive fire that could halt or impede enemy advances. Its reliability in the harsh, varied terrain of Vietnam proved invaluable. Soldiers also often modified the M60 for greater efficiency, sometimes removing the bipod or stock for better maneuverability. And in Vietnam, the M60 would eventually come to be used in every conceivable role for a machine gun. Some were mounted on trucks, jeeps, armored personnel carriers, and other vehicles, others on tripods inside fortifications, and yet others on aircraft and boats. But as made famous by Sylvester Stallone's Rambo, the M60 saw its widest use with American infantry forces on the ground. An infantry machine gun section officially consisted of three soldiers, the gunner, the assistant gunner, and the ammunition carrier. In practice, all members of a patrol carried extra machine gun ammunition, which was passed up to the gun crew when needed. American infantrymen carried the now famous belts of ammunition draped around their bodies. This was the easiest way to carry the heavy load, and it left the soldiers' hands free to use other weapons. The most common complaint about the M60 was that it was still too heavy, particularly when trying to move through the thick jungle on foot. The safety was awkward to operate and worked opposite the M16 rifle, requiring an upward movement of the thumb to free the safety and make the gun ready to fire. Fired cartridges could also become torn and required extra time to remove an empty case, a less than ideal situation in combat. Another issue was that with no gas regulator on the gun, there were sometimes issues with the firing mechanism. Accumulated dirt or dust could slow down the piston and result in the M60 jamming or running away, continuing to fire even when the finger was removed from the trigger. For many soldiers, this was terrifying, especially when the assistant M60 gunner would be forced to hold onto the ammunition belt manually to stop it from feeding. The M60's role in Vietnam was not just tactical, but also symbolic becoming representative of American presence in Vietnam to both supporters and opponents of the conflict. It also featured in many of the most daring stories from Vietnam, like that of Lance Corporal Richard Pittman. On the morning of July 22, 1966, Pittman was with a company of United States Marines as they moved silently along a jungle trail in Vietnam's Quang Tri province. Suddenly, a battalion of North Vietnamese soldiers ambushed the lead platoon, immediately inflicting massive casualties and pinning down the survivors. As cries for more firepower came out across the radios, Corporal Pittman ditched his rifle, picked up an M60, and rushed forward with no regard for his own safety. Using the weapon, he destroyed two enemy machine gun positions at point-blank range before dodging incoming mortars to reach the front of the patrol. When he found the wounded Marines, a force of 30 to 40 enemy soldiers charged his position. Again facing down death, Pittman positioned the M60 in the center of the trail and opened fire. When he ran out of ammunition, 
he grabbed one of the wounded Marine's machine guns and continued shooting, and when he ran out of ammo again, he hurled a grenade and started dragging casualties to the rear of the platoon. Pittman would be awarded the Medal of Honor for his actions, just one of many cases where the M60 would prove invaluable. After the Vietnam War, the M60 continued to see action in various conflicts. It was used in the late 20th century's military engagements, including the Gulf War and the conflicts in the Balkans. The M60 underwent modifications and upgrades over the years, adapting to new tactical requirements and technological advancements. The US military would eventually produce eight different variants of the M60, aiming to increase its versatility and solve some of the issues which it experienced in Vietnam. The first of these was the M60E1. While the bipod on the original M60 was located under the barrel, the M60E1s was attached to the gas tube, which made barrel changes easier. The next major improvement came in 1986, when the M60E3 was introduced. The M60E3 featured a receiver-mounted bipod, an ambidextrous safety, and a much simplified gas system. It also had universal sling attachments and a carrying handle to help gunners deal with the weight. The new design also shaved 5 pounds off the original M60 design, but the lighter frame and skinnier barrel were still prone to breaking and overheating. By the turn of the century, the M60 series of machine guns was being replaced by the heavier, albeit more reliable, M240, as well as the lighter 5.56 firing M249. And while most Army and Marine Corps units transitioned to the newer weapons, the Navy SEALs embraced the M60's final iteration, the M60E4. Sometimes known as the Mark 43, this variant proved to be the most reliable M60 model. It came with three barrel options, a long barrel, a short barrel, and an even shorter assault barrel. The assault barrel brought the overall weight of the weapon down to 21 pounds, making it one of the most manageable medium machine guns ever built. And all three barrel options are lined with Stellite, which improved the weapon's heat resistance and overall longevity. The M60E3 also added rails for attaching optics and lasers, as well as an adjustable front sight, reducing the tendency for gunners to spray and pray. The other variants of the gun were produced specifically to be vehicle-mounted. This includes the M60E2, which was designed for armored vehicles and M60 pattern tanks. The M60E2 was manufactured without a pistol grip or buttstock, and was intended to be fired electronically with a remote. Its gas tube was also larger than the ground variants, so gas could be expended outside of the vehicle. Another variant is the M60D, which is pintle-mounted and features a spade grip rather than the standard pistol grip. It's also controlled by a designated door gunner rather than the helicopter's pilot. The M60C, on the other hand, closely resembled the M60D, but featured an electronic control system, allowing pilots to control and fire the machine gun from the cockpit. However, today, the most commonly used variant is the M60E6, developed by the Nevada-based company US Ordnance beginning in the late 1990s. Like the M60E1, E3, and E4 before it, the E6's top cover can be closed with the bolt in the forward position. But on the M60E6, the feed mechanism is improved for additional pull strength, allowing for better feeding when there is resistance on the belt, and largely stopping the M60's notorious issues with jamming. Earlier problems with the retention of parts and parts walking out were also fixed in redesigns over the last 20 years. The E6's bipod is further updated from the M60E3 design to be stronger, simpler, and easier to use while mounted. Another old problem of the M60, where different rear sights were required for different barrels, was resolved by adding an adjustable front sight on the barrel. The flash hider is also redesigned for better efficiency. Finally, the M60E6 adds rails to allow for the mounting of optics and lasers. The result of these years of upgrades is that the M60E6 can rival or surpass almost any other machine gun in use today. For instance, independent testing by Dan Shear of Small Arms Defense Review found that the M60E6 averaged around 8,300 mean rounds between failures, a figure better than either the M60E4 or M240 during 1994 army tests. The E6's all-round excellent performance is the major reason why it became the machine gun of choice for the Royal Danish Army in 2014, and why it continues to be used by even US Navy SEALs today. While it's difficult to say whether it's the best machine gun on the market, there is no doubt that over the years, the variants of the M60 have proven their worth time and time again. But we want to hear from you. How do you think the M60 measures up to other machine guns, and how important was it to US military success? 
Let us know your thoughts in the comments below and don't forget to subscribe for more military content and analysis. The F-22 Raptor is one of America's premier fighter aircraft. The nation's first fifth-generation, multi-purpose fighter aircraft was designed to carry the United States into the 21st century and triumph over any near-peer competitor. However, despite its advanced technologies and capabilities, the plane was doomed to failure right from the start due to a combination of factors, including competing projects and no enemies to fight. And perhaps worst of all for the plane's manufacturer Lockheed Martin, it was never exported to foreign countries like other aircraft have been when newer ones come online for the US military. Here are the reasons why it failed. First and foremost, despite its reputation, the F-22 is still the world's premier air superiority fighter aircraft. American engineers designed it to locate, engage, and destroy enemy aircraft before those pilots even knew they were being targeted. The capability of the F-22 in the air-to-air -air domain was tested in the early 2000s, when it took out hundreds of aircraft in simulated kills while suffering just one loss of its own. Because of this air-to-air -air dominance, the F-22 focuses primarily on this capability, and its ground attack mission set is only secondary. This is evidenced by the fact that the aircraft did not perform its first combat missions until 2014 against ISIS in Iraq and Syria. While this probably seemed like a waste of resources, with the advanced air defense systems given to the Syrians by Russia, the US needed to ensure that the Syrian military would not shoot down their aircraft since the US had carried out strikes against them in the past. Compared to newer aircraft like the F-35, the Raptor still retains its primary role as the main tool the United States uses to obtain and maintain air dominance over the enemy. The F-35, for example, was designed to meet the needs of all the services, and this included creating a model to take off vertically from ships and with a primary focus on ground attack. Though the F-35 is a fifth-generation fighter with excellent stealth capabilities, it would never compare to how well the Raptor can perform in aerial combat, since America didn't design it for that. However, unlike the F-35, the Raptor from the beginning was never designed nor intended to be produced as an export aircraft. This is because during the 1980s, when the aircraft was first being designed, the US wanted to have the edge over any aircraft China or Russia could throw at it. As a result, the advanced stealth capabilities like the composites, radars, electronics, and various avionics, including computer software and electronic warfare suites, were all classified as top secret. The military intended that only the US and specifically only the Air Force would be the ones to operate this aircraft. Because of this, Equipment like the communication suites, radars, and software installed on board was the most advanced and capable in the US arsenal. As is typical for aircraft with foreign military sales in mind, systems like these are purposefully left out of the frame to be installed in the country of sale with their own equipment, or produced with a less capable version that still allows interoperability. Even if the military designed the F-22 with export in mind, that would all change in 1998, when Congress made it a law to forever ban the sale of the Raptor to any foreign country. The amendment was passed as part of the 1998 Defense Authorization Act and was designed to protect these critical technologies from anyone else. However, codifying this into law was probably not necessary anyway, because of many factors that would have precluded the United States from exporting the aircraft. One of the primary reasons that the military could not have exported the aircraft was the cost. During the 1980s, the F-22 was first imagined. The Air Force intended to buy 750 of these aircraft. However, as cost overruns continued, this number was revised to 650 and then 381. In 2009, the Secretary of Defense authorized that just 195 of these aircraft would be procured and no more. The government reduced these numbers dramatically due to the enormous cost overruns that plagued the project, very similar to what was happening with the F-35. In the beginning, the Air Force estimated that the industry could produce the planes at the cost of just $120 million per aircraft, adjusted for inflation, of course. However, as development slowed and testing came to a halt, the aircraft would eventually come out with a price tag of almost $400 million per aircraft. Accounting for inflation and the maintenance costs over the lifespan of the aircraft, each Raptor is estimated to cost a whopping $700 million. There are several reasons why the aircraft costs so much, which would exclude it as a prime candidate for foreign sales since these aircraft must usually be cheap and quick to manufacture. The F-22 was neither of those. Development for the plane began in 1986, when the US government awarded the contract to start production. The testing and design phase lasted through the 1990s, and production started in the early 2000s. The first operational aircraft was delivered to the Air Force in 2005, meaning that the time from conception to the first operational flight was almost 20 years. 
With such a long lead time, the rest of the defense industry developed around it, while the design languished on the drawing board. Citing the Air Force's 2017 feasibility study, the service noted that when the Raptor was first designed, the Air Force intended to combat enemies in a contested air environment. A contested air environment would mean the aircraft would encounter things such as enemy fighters and air defense missile batteries. However, as the report has noted, the world has dramatically changed since the Raptor first came out. The Air Force now assesses that by the time it would take to retool the manufacturing base for a potential export model, the Raptor would be facing highly contested airspaces. This means that the future operating environment the Raptor would face had the Air Force and Congress decided to start production in 2017 would be too fraught with danger to maintain the edge it had before. With the proliferation of advanced air defense radars and missiles across the world, as well as new fighter aircraft designed to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the F-22, as well as an increase in the cyber warfare domain, the threats to the F-22 would become so much as to question its feasibility on the battlefield. As a result, the Air Force warned that restarting production for an aircraft for sale might mean that they will be obsolete when these aircraft are delivered anyway. However, simply telling the aviation industry that Congress had the money and a buyer for new Raptors to be exported was not feasible. One of the main reasons was the production of the B-21 stealth bomber and ongoing projects to develop the F-35. Because the F-22 took so long to design and produce, the F-35 was ordered into existence beginning in the early 1990s to cut down on costs associated with future aircraft development for all the services. While most of the time the program was just in its infancy, after the F-22 started to roll off the production line, the F-35 program started to take off. In addition, the aerospace industry needed resources to produce the B-21 bomber. Therefore, from the early 2000s to about 2010, three major aircraft programs were competing for funding. During this time, the United States was also experiencing the worst recession in decades and the troop drawdown from Iraq. Because of this, the defense budget would be carefully scrutinized to prevent any costs not deemed absolutely necessary. Because of this limited funding, Congress, through the Department of Defense, had to make some tough decisions. They could continue producing the additional several hundred F-22s or pour money into the two other programs. However, due to political and operational considerations to be discussed later on, the decision was made to curtail the production to just 195 aircraft and invest those funds elsewhere. Since Congress was now investing funds into the B-21 and F-35, companies like Lockheed Martin, Boeing, Northup Grumman, and others had to retool and refocus their efforts on these developing projects since they are private companies not going to work for free. Because these companies had to refocus their efforts, the tooling and supply chain for the F-22 began to deteriorate. Since the F-22 is so state-of-the-art, it required brand new tools to be created to produce it. The Air Force estimated that the industry used over 50,000 tools to make the aircraft, with many of them being newly designed. Additionally, these tools produced another estimated 90,000 unique parts to build the plane from the ground up. With production now shifting to other aircraft, the aerospace industry did not have the resources to produce all of the aircraft simultaneously. Another factor that the aerospace industry lacked that would preclude building export models was the lack of knowledge. According to a study published by the RAND Corporation in 2010, they estimated that if the production did not resume within three years, the aerospace industry would lose 100% of its knowledge in building the aircraft. In 2017, the Air Force produced their own study that contradicted those claims but still painted a grim picture. The Air Force estimated that of the 40 different companies involved in making the F-22, at least half of them would require retraining. At the cost of over $30 million per company, simply retraining the industry to build the aircraft would cost almost a billion dollars. However, the Air Force acknowledged that this was a conservative estimate and that the actual cost could be much higher. The Air Force's own study estimated the total cost to rebuild the program to be at least $10 billion just from what equipment and parts were available. However, that number is slightly flawed since the Air Force admitted that the export version of the F-22 was never designed, nor were any plans drawn up for how it would look. The figures presented were simply for restart in production for US consumption and not for foreign countries. Developing a brand new aircraft from the ground up could see similar costs as before and preclude any cost savings from building new aircraft, which the nation's air service estimated could be brought down to $216 million per plane. Building a new export model of the F-22 also did not factor in the international support the US would need to do it. After all, if the aircraft is designed for foreign use, it is essential that the end users of the plane also get a say in its design to meet their own needs, so that the end product is not just an American model that they think they need. 
Like with the F-35, multiple countries have invested from the beginning. However, even if the export model were approved and designed, its market would have been somewhat limited. Despite the 1998 ban on allowing foreign sales of the F-22, that did not stop the governments of Japan, Australia and Israel from making repeated requests at buying some. Beginning around the mid-2000s, these countries were interested in a small yet competent fleet of aircraft, and their primary motivation was because the F-35 program was taking too long. Additionally, the F-22 had years of data and thousands of flight hours of safe operations testifying to its capabilities. With the F-35 still not being operational yet at the time, these countries wanted an immediate replacement for their aging aircraft. However, despite repeated calls for selling it, the US remained steadfast in not producing or even designing an export model. As a result, these countries would eventually lose interest and invest their time and money into perfecting the F-35. Ultimately, these countries became customers of the F-35 program and operate them today instead of the F-22. Therefore, even if the US had designed an export model, it would have come too late to garner any buyers in the international market. In addition to the actual costs of restarting the program, do you remember those political costs we mentioned earlier? One of the main reasons that doomed the F-22 from future production and killed the chance of any foreign sales was, at the time, it was an aircraft without an enemy. When it came out in 2005, it had already missed both invasions of Iraq and faced no conventional enemy on the battlefield. The Air Force recognized this and did not let it participate in ground combat until the 2014 Syrian strikes. Because it was an aircraft with no enemy to fight and competitors lagging years behind it, it was decided there would only ever be 195 of the aircraft. The political decision to cancel the aircraft despite the Air Force stating that it still needed more came down to the Secretary of Defense. At the time, the SecDef said that the US had only one near-peer competitor now, China, and that Russia was still years behind in developing an aircraft that could come close to touching it. If that were not enough, more Raptors did not have the support of the President either, who stated that he would veto the 2010 defense budget if it included funding for any more Raptors. Therefore, due to high costs, no intention to involve foreign partners, no mission at the time, and political wrangling, the F-22 would be forever destined to serve in a US military capacity only. What would it be like to live and work in the middle of the sea? For roughly 4,500 individuals, this isn't a hypothetical question, but a daily reality. These individuals are sailors who live and work aboard the USS Gerald R. Ford CVN-78, a nuclear-powered 100,000-ton giant of a ship, the Ford, as sailors refer to it, eclipses all other active naval vessels globally, setting new standards in size and power. As of 2024, this extraordinary display of engineering and naval might is considered the world's largest aircraft carrier and the largest warship ever constructed. Given its sheer size, it shouldn't be surprising that this carrier is often called a city at sea. But what is life like for citizens of this marvelous place? In the words of one of these residents, a petty officer first class in the US Navy, there isn't anything like living on an aircraft carrier. To understand what makes life on the Ford unique, let's board this miniature floating city on its epic odyssey. Welcome aboard. As much as we'd like to explore the insides of this colossal vessel immediately, we'd be doing it a disservice if we didn't first acknowledge its impressive exterior. The Ford is roughly 1,100 feet long and 256 feet wide. This means that the ship's deck spans the size of approximately four football fields, which are 300 feet long and 160 feet wide. As for the height, the Ford stands at 250 feet. To understand just how tall this is, you only need to know that the Statue of Liberty is about 305 feet, from the heel to the tip of the torch. But just because the Ford is absolutely massive, it doesn't mean it travels slowly. This remarkable ship can sustain a speed of over 35 miles per hour, 30 knots. This impressive speed places it among the world's fastest aircraft carriers, allowing it to travel across the ocean in a matter of weeks and even outrun most submarines. Now you might be thinking, this might not have come cheap, and you'd be absolutely right. The USS Gerald R. Ford construction cost roughly $12.8 billion in materials and labor, and that's not to mention the $4.7 billion spent on research and development. Thanks to these figures, the Ford can add another superlative to its long list of accomplishments, the world's most expensive aircraft carrier. And if the Navy is to be believed, it's also the most adaptable and lethal combat platform in the world. Of course, a ship of this magnitude wasn't constructed overnight. 
Construction began on August 11, 2005, and 12 years would pass before the USS Gerald R. Ford was formally commissioned. Former President Donald Trump had the honor of placing this ship in active service on July 22, 2017. If all goes according to plan, the Navy expects the Ford to remain a part of its fleet for 90 years. With this in mind, let's see what sailors living on this ship during its potential 90-year service life might experience. One look inside the Gerald R. Ford is enough for the City at Sea moniker to truly come to life. The living conditions on board are critical for the success of most modern military operations of maritime aviation, so it shouldn't be surprising that the USS Gerald R. Ford is equipped with state-of-the-art facilities to support the well-being and functionality of its inhabitants. Essentially, this floating city has almost all the facilities you'd find on land, including a kitchen, a grocery store, a gym, a medical clinic, and numerous recreational areas. These facilities aim to provide sailors with all the amenities they need to live and work comfortably while defending the US's interests worldwide. After all, this is the only way for them to stay in the best possible physical and mental condition and carry out their duties efficiently. But enough with the prelude. Let's embark on a tour of this maritime marvel. The Ford's entrance leads to a massive hangar bay where you'll find aircraft that aren't currently used. At the hangar bay, you'll also find a statue of the ship's namesake, former President Gerald R. Ford. Beyond the obvious symbolism, President Ford's statue might have something to do with luck. You see, President Ford served on an aircraft carrier, the USS Monterey, CVL-26, from June 1943 to December 1944. As an assistant navigation officer, athletic officer – he played football at the University of Michigan – and an anti-aircraft battery officer, Ford was credited by his shipmates for saving the USS Monterey during a particularly nasty storm. However, grounded aircraft and lucky statues aren't everything you'll find in the hangar bay. You might also see an inflated big screen showing the latest NFL game with excited sailors gathered to catch a break from their duties. Besides the hangar on football Sundays and Mondays, sailors can also relax in one of the many recreational facilities available on the Ford. Well-equipped gyms, fitness rooms, sports fields, and expansive relaxation areas are just some of these facilities dedicated to promoting the crew's physical and emotional well-being. Sailors can use these facilities to work on their fitness, but also to unwind, momentarily escape the work stress, and connect with fellow crew members. Connecting with other sailors is especially important since life at sea, away from your loved ones, can be rather isolating. That's why the US Navy made sure to equip the USS Gerald R. Ford with access to various communication tools, including computers and USB ports for hassle-free device charging. This allows sailors to email, video chat, or connect with their loved ones via social media, helping alleviate some of the feelings of loneliness. However, there are facilities where sailors certainly won't feel lonely, or at least alone, the ship's sleeping areas. These areas are lined with bunk beds, tightly arranged to optimize the limited space. Now, to be fair, the sleeping quarters at the Ford have been redesigned to include fewer beds and, in turn, fewer people in each room. These quarters don't include more than 86 people, which is a substantial departure from the sleeping units of Nimitz-class carriers that accommodate up to 200 sailors. But let's be honest, that might still feel like 80 people more than should be in the same room to some sailors. Each of these crowded sleeping areas, or berthing units as they're often called, features an adjoining bathroom. Interestingly, bathrooms are among the most talked-about facilities at the USS Gerald R. Ford. Why? Because the Ford is the first and only US Navy ship to be entirely outfitted with gender-neutral bathrooms. In other words, there are no urinals on the USS Gerald R. Ford. Believe it or not, this change has stirred up quite a heated debate among sailors and experts. Some of them salute this departure from dedicating entire areas to one gender and praise the convenience and flexibility that come with it. With these bathrooms, there's no need to change the ship's infrastructure when its crew makeup changes. Although women make up only 18% of the Navy, this move is seen as a step toward a more inclusive environment. However, the opposing side focuses on the functionality and sanitation of these facilities. The sit-down toilets that can be found on the Ford are said to be less sanitary than the traditional urinals. In addition, the stalls around these toilets take up more space, while a urinal requires around 1,500 square inches of space. A stall calls for more than double, at least 3,300 square inches. It might also interest you to know that every flush on the Ford uses water from the surrounding sea, a testament to the ship's self-sufficiency. The same desalinated seawater is also used for drinking. Speaking of drinking, let's take a peek into the Ford's cafeteria. 
The first thing you'll notice is the overarching theme, the Big Ten Conference. If you're not a football fan, this is the oldest Division I collegiate athletic conference in the US. This theme is quite on par with President Ford's history as a collegiate football player and fan. After having a cup of coffee or a drink of their choice, sailors can go to one of the mess halls to enjoy breakfast according to a set schedule, typically starting at 6 a.m. Of course, the same strict schedule applies to lunch and dinner. But to understand how thousands of sailors can be fed nutritious meals daily, we must visit arguably the most impressive facility on the Ford, the kitchen. First things first, let's make sure we use the correct term. The ship's kitchen is referred to as a galley. Aircraft carriers typically include more than one galley, and the Ford is no different. The ship has two operational galleys, where all the cooking is done, but just how much cooking are we talking about? Let's say there are 4,500 crew members on the Ford at a time. This means that 13,500 meals must be prepared daily. That is, if we're only counting breakfast, lunch, and dinner, but what about midnight rations, or mid-rats, for short? These unofficial fourth meals of the day are sailors' favorites and bring the total meal tally up to 18,000. This figure is noteworthy in and of itself when you consider only about 100 sailors participate in making these meals. Talk about a culinary miracle. Of course, there's no magic in the galleys, only precision, efficiency, and a well-orchestrated culinary operation. This operation is orchestrated by culinary specialists who run the galleys. Each specialist has their own crew, consisting of ship cooks, butchers, bakers, and a chief commissary steward. This steward is responsible for distributing the food to the cooks and assisting the head chef in the meal planning process. Consider the sheer amount of food prepared daily. It shouldn't be surprising that these cooks work with some enormous equipment. For instance, the station for butchering meat features band saws that can slice through large cuts of meat without hassle. Similarly, in the bakery, you'll find a giant dough mixer with a capacity of 60 pounds. The galleys are also equipped with industrial ovens, deep-fat fryers, grills, and huge machines for steaming vegetables. Since large, huge, giant, and enormous seem to be the key words here, you probably won't be surprised by the massive amounts of food that get consumed aboard an aircraft carrier. During a single day, the crew members can eat as much as 1,600 pounds of chicken, 350 pounds of lettuce, 160 gallons of milk, and 30 cases of cereal. These insane amounts beg the question, how can the culinary crew pull these meals off? Well, it all starts with proper planning. Meals are planned 15 days in advance. Once a week, both fresh and dry commodities are replenished to keep up with this demanding schedule. A demanding schedule is also what the ship's culinary specialists adhere to. They get up at 3 a.m. every morning to ensure the breakfast is ready by 6. However, the hard labor doesn't stop after 6, as every minute in the galley must be productive to keep up with the demand for the remaining daily meals. Plus, cooks make it a point to prepare each meal to a high standard, ensuring the sailors can enjoy delicious food even when they're thousands of miles away from home. To keep the morale high, cooks will also introduce some variety and creativity into the meal schedule. That's why it isn't uncommon for this schedule to feature a Taco Tuesday, or meals using regional delicacies like Greek feta cheese and Mongolian barbecue. Although every day aboard the Ford is a feast, sailors will get an extra special treat on their birthday. To celebrate this day, sailors are typically given a lunch featuring a lobster or prime rib main course. These courses are served on a tablecloth and paired with wine and pleasant background music for a memorable dining experience. But why is so much attention paid to the food on the Ford beyond the obvious health-related reasons? Well, food has historically been one of the most critical aspects of service in the US Navy. Early on, a good meal was even one of the most important factors in recruitment. At the time, food wasn't as nearly diverse as it is today, so sailors wanted a guarantee they would be well-fed aboard the ship. After all, sailors in charge of the more labor-intensive tasks can burn over 4,000 calories a day, so nutritious and satisfying meals are crucial for their energy and well-being. To further emphasize the importance of sailors' well-being, the Ford also features comprehensive healthcare and welfare facilities. The central medical facility is often referred to as the sick bay, and it serves as a hub for medical care on the USS Gerald R. Ford. Here, sailors can seek medical help, whether preventative or emergency care, routine checkups or medication management. They'll receive that help from qualified medical personnel, including doctors, nurses, and medical technicians, available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Since their mental health is as important as physical, sailors also have access to counselors and spiritual care providers aboard the Ford. 
These individuals try to help sailors overcome any psychological or emotional challenges they might encounter during deployment. Their professional and, more importantly, confidential services range from one-on-one -on -one conversations to group sessions helping sailors cope with stress, the emotional and physical strain of life at sea, and separation from their loved ones. The goal of these services and facilities, like all the others mentioned so far in this video, is to make sailors feel as supported as possible. There's another facility aboard the Ford that can also contribute to keeping the crew grounded, a grocery store. This store allows sailors to access essential supplies and comforts, creating a sense of normalcy during deployment. Here they can purchase basic supplies like razors and other hygiene products. They can also find highly specialized items like coffee blends, tobacco products and protein shakes. As far as food goes, sailors can buy everything from potatoes to tasty candy. And let us tell you, they definitely take advantage of these diverse shopping options. The grocery store on the Ford averages around $10,000 in sales per day, with over 1,000 individual transactions. All the proceeds from the store are invested back into the ship, or its welfare and recreation activities, to be precise. But how can this store in the middle of an ocean remain stocked with such a high number of daily transactions? The answer is simple – replenishment at sea. Replenishment at Sea is the US Navy's logistics operation aimed at resupplying ships with a range of necessities, thus allowing them to remain at sea indefinitely. These necessities include grocery items, fuel, ammunition, and food for the galleys. A single replenishment can provide an aircraft carrier with between 400,000 and 1 million pounds of food. So how does this replenishment at sea work? Well, there are two ways in which this operation can be carried out vertical replenishment and alongside connected replenishment. The former is done while the ship is in motion and includes the use of a cargo helicopter. Vertical replenishment is significantly faster and safer than its alternative but offers less capacity. Since a helicopter is involved in this process, there's only so much cargo that can be transferred at once. No such limitations exist in the alongside connected replenishment method. After all, this method involves a separate ship filled with supplies. Here's what this replenishment process looks like. The supply ship maintains a constant speed, ranging from 12 to 16 knots. This vessel is then approached by the receiving ship until they're roughly 30 yards apart. When an ideal distance is achieved, a shot line will be fired from the supply ship and used to pull all the necessary supplies across. Afterward, supplies are transferred to the hangar bay to be sorted and distributed to their respective units. Thanks to this process, sailors at the Ford can have virtually anything they want at any time. As you've probably noticed, all the facilities mentioned so far primarily deal with leisure and sailors' time off. But what about their working environment? After all, working is as much part of life at sea as relaxing, sleeping and eating, if not more. Though there are numerous professional areas aboard the USS Gerald R. Ford, none is more important than the flight deck. This 256-foot-wide, 1,092-foot-long deck serves as the epicenter of the ship's air operations so let's head up there. At first glance, the flight deck might seem like a chaotic scene with a lot of noise, workers moving in all directions, and aircraft being prepared for takeoff and landing, but this couldn't be further from the truth. There's nothing chaotic about the Ford's flight deck. Instead, every single move is meticulously planned and executed with precision. This deck is primarily overrun by three personnel types. Aircraft handling personnel in charge of moving the aircraft around the deck and positioning them for takeoff and landing. Aircraft maintenance personnel, responsible for servicing and repairing the aircraft. Flight tech operations personnel, in charge of coordinating the flight deck activities and maintaining safety. Safety is one of the most important considerations for the Ford, as the carrier's flight deck is one of the most hazardous workplaces in the world. How is this possible? Well, sailors are exposed to deafening noise while surrounded by as many as 60 aircraft and 200 people crammed into a limited space. This combination creates a physically and mentally demanding environment fraught with potential dangers. The unbearable noise is also why communicating via spoken word is virtually impossible on the flight deck. That's why the Navy has developed a system of gestures and hand signals for communication. Essentially, sailors use something akin to sign language to convey important information, instructions and commands. Naturally, this unique sign language is standardized and taught during the US Navy training. Here are some of the most commonly used gestures and movements and their brief explanation. Kneeling. If the individual kneeling is wearing a yellow shirt, they're giving the catapult crew the signal to shoot. Individuals wearing green shirts and kneeling are members of the catapult crew, indicating that they're waiting for the next aircraft's catapult to come up. 
thumbs up. If the pilot gives the captain a thumbs up, they're ready to take off. However, the takeoff can only happen after a yellow shirt gives the same gesture, confirming that the catapult is ready. The pilot can also use this gesture upon landing to indicate that the jet is up for maintenance. Hands up. The hands up signal is usually shown during the potentially life-threatening process of arming the aircraft before loading it into the catapult. This signal ensures the pilot has both hands visible at all times, preventing accidental activations of control systems. As a response to this signal, the pilot will extend both arms forward and place a fist within the other hand's palm. Coincidentally, the noise that prevents oral communication is also often quoted as the worst aspect of living and working at sea. The roaring jet engines, catapult launches, and screeching wind create a high decibel environment that's often too much to bear. These unprecedented noise levels wreak havoc on the sailor's hearing and their entire body. To make matters worse, there's no escape. Even when they aren't on the flight deck, sailors can still experience the lingering effects of a carrier's hellish noise. It takes extraordinary mental resilience, determination and focus to not let this noise break you, not to mention special technology like noise-cancelling headphones and even custom-made earplugs. Unfortunately, the noise is far from the only challenge of living in this fascinating city at sea. As exciting as this life is, sailors also describe it as intense, cramped, and isolating. These adjectives can help you predict which challenges lie ahead. Let's start with the intensity. Living and working aboard the Ford is undoubtedly tough and exhausting. Sailors are often subjected to intense work schedules that require long working hours and irregular shifts that can last up to 24 hours. Throw the responsibility behind each role and the outside elements into the mix and you'll understand the demanding nature of life on board the Ford. Next up, limited space. Despite the changes made to the USS Gerald R. Ford, sailors must still share cramped sleeping quarters with dozens of fellow service members. In such an environment, you can bid farewell to privacy, room for personal belongings, and a sense of personal space. Things don't get much better beyond the berthing units. The entire Ford can feel like one massive labyrinth, with narrow passages that require careful maneuvering. As we've already mentioned, the outside of the ship is no better, as the flight deck can be one of the most cramped spaces on the entire ship. And the final adjective used to describe life at sea is isolating. Despite all the supportive services and communication tools provided by the Navy, one thing remains the same. Sailors are away from their loved ones for months on end. Lengthy deployments can take a considerable toll on the sailor's psyche, as they usually miss out on important milestones, family reunions, and other significant moments. Sure, this is the case for most soldiers, not just the ones at sea, but sailors arguably have it worse. Why? They are virtually cut off from the outside world. Believe it or not, sailors working below deck can go weeks without seeing any daylight. And even when they do, it's all sky and sea, a constant reminder of their isolated existence. But luckily, it's not all bad. There are also some positive traditions sailors associate with the sea. Take the swim call as an example. In this tradition, sailors jump off the ship to blow off steam and enjoy a refreshing break. Interestingly, easing tension wasn't the main reason behind the swim calls of the past. Instead, sailors would jump into the waters as this was the only way for them to have a bath. Nowadays, these calls are primarily for fun. Before they take place, a commanding officer will check whether the sea is at an appropriate temperature for a swim. If so, the officer will notify all departments, and the swim call will officially be underway. To make these calls even more enjoyable, sailors will often make them into a competition. These competitions can involve sailors battling each other for the most skilled jump or the longest time spent in the water. However, they can also have the sailors dressing up in whimsical costumes before diving into the water. But as exciting as these swim calls sound, they aren't all fun and games. After all, sailors are usually jumping from roughly 30 feet, which is the standard height of an Olympic diving platform. Plus, they're jumping into potentially turbulent waters, adding an element of risk to the thrill. That's why these jumps must be executed with precision and careful consideration to avoid any injuries. After enjoying swimming in the warm waters and hopefully winning the longest swim contest, the sailor will be brought back to the ship using cargo nets. Sometimes, swim calls are accompanied by the so-called still beach parties. During this fun tradition, sailors play music and cook barbecue on the flight deck while their companions swim in the sea. These and many other ingenious traditions help sailors foster camaraderie amidst the challenges of life at sea. Together, they try to find the beauty in this unique life, constantly reminding themselves of the importance of their service in protecting the freedoms and values that keep the nation safe. But what about you? 
Would you be able to handle living aboard the USS Gerald R. Ford? Or do you think life at sea is just too much to bear? Share all your thoughts about the fascinating city at sea in the comments section below. The rise of powerful artificial intelligence is threatening to put much of the human workforce out of a job. Soldiers and sailors are among those whose jobs may be threatened by the rise of AI. Meet the Sea Hunter, the world's biggest drone ship to date, and one whose coming arrival signals that the AI revolution extends far beyond cyberspace or the skies. Drones have been an increasingly important part of warfare for the past decade or more. It is easy to see why politicians and the military brass would have a fondness for them. They are cheap and expendable, making them easy choices for risky missions. However, drones are becoming essential to the conduct of military operations in general and integrating themselves into the heart of a fighting force's ability to wage war effectively. The fighting between Armenia and Azerbaijan in 2020 was perhaps the clearest demonstration that drones had arrived as one of the most important items on the battlefield. In that conflict, the Azerbaijanis used drones to devastating effect against the Armenian army, which had always been blessed with superior soldiers and officers until then. Azerbaijan turned this situation around by using drones to reconnoiter the Armenian lines and reserve placements, direct firepower against ideal targets, and then use the drones to guide ground assets against the Armenian reserves, effectively cutting off the Armenian forces from one another and destroying them in detail. Drones have proven to be as important in the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Both sides have used them in important operations, with Russians using Iranian drones on Ukrainian civilian infrastructure. Meanwhile, the Ukrainians have used anti-personnel and anti-armor drones against Russian supply lines, among other targets. The wide-scale, multi-purpose use of drones in the war between Russia and Ukraine reveals how central they are becoming in warfare. Up to now, unmanned assets have largely been associated with air power, targeted killings, and surveillance for fighting on the ground. But the Sea Hunter is one of the first signs that this is about to change. Drones are now taking to the seas. In the spring of 2016, the United States Navy christened a new ship. With a price tag of $23 million, the ship was an unmanned surface vehicle USV, called the Sea Hunter, officially known as the Medium Displacement Unmanned Surface Vehicle MDUSV. The Sea Hunter originated as part of DARPA's Anti-Submarine Warfare Continuous Trail Unmanned Vessel ACTUV program. In 2018, Fred Kennedy, then director of DARPA's Tactical Technology Office, described the vessel as part of the US military's plan to trade small numbers of very capable, high-value assets for large numbers of commoditized, simpler platforms that are much more capable in the aggregate. He analogized it to trading smaller numbers of kings and queens on the maritime chessboard for a lot of pawns that were of lower quality, but when taken as a whole, would get the job done more cheaply and effectively than traditional naval assets. In a sign of the concept's initial success, DARPA officially transferred the Sea Hunter to the Office of Naval Research on January 30, 2018. The Sea Hunter measures 132 feet in length. It is a trimaran vessel made up of carbon composite materials. The drone ship is capable of traveling at up to speeds of 27 knots, about 31 miles per hour, powered by its diesel engines that can carry 40 tons of fuel, enough to last for months. The Sea Hunter is designed to have an effective range of 10,000 nautical miles, putting any designated mission area in the world within its reach. It will also be designed to remain operational without any human prompting for at least 70 days. In this way, the Sea Hunter's mission duration is much like a traditional ship or submarine. However, these months-long voyages for manned assets are always expensive. One of the reasons why the Navy is so excited about unmanned ships like the Sea Hunter is because the drones will be able to take some of the same long voyages at a fraction of the cost of doing them the traditional way. The Sea Hunter could do some of the same anti-submarine tactics with 10 or more times less expenditure than doing them the traditional way. The Sea Hunter's primary purpose is to find enemy submarines. To do this, it has sophisticated sonar and radar that can specifically detect diesel-electric submarines, which are quieter than the US Navy's nuclear submarines when they run on electric power. Diesel-electric submarines are the type that currently compose the bulk of the undersea's fleet for China's People's Liberation Army Navy PLAN. 
signaling what the US Naval Brass intends the Sea Hunter's primary mission to be. The Sea Hunter is not yet operational, but if it joins the fleet, it, or whatever succeeds it, will be able to complete its missions without any human input, even from remote control. Its designers have stated that the Sea Hunter is meant to be an autonomous ship, so that it can do tasks it needs to do on its own. It operates purely on artificial intelligence, which gets information from its sophisticated radar and electronic systems. In 2016, Scott Littlefield, the project manager for DARPA, said, We didn't want a remote control vessel. We actually wanted something that could behave appropriately and do complicated missions under what we call sparse human control. To ensure that those complicated missions get done, the Sea Hunter boasts a capability to maintain constant communications with other ships and satellite systems. Taken together, these assets are designed to replace the traditional human crew in information gathering and decision making, at least in the immediate term. Sea Hunter vessels are not currently designed to carry weapons. They are essentially the maritime equivalent of surveillance drones. Their mission would be to spot hostile submarines. They would not attack them on their own initiative, however. Once the Sea Hunter spots a suspicious or enemy submarine, the artificial intelligence will then notify more traditional, manned naval assets about the submarine's location. The humans aboard those ships would then make the decision about whether or not they could attack the spotted submarine. This mission will require constant communication between the Sea Hunter and traditional assets via satellite. After identifying a target, the Sea Hunter will move on to other potential targets and predict what they will do next. In addition to tracking submarines, the Sea Hunter has programs in place that would allow its artificial intelligence to track international ships and monitor shipping routes. It can act as a deterrent as well, trailing potentially hostile craft and directing them to comply with the commands that human operators make in that situation. This ability would make the Sea Hunter a valuable asset in the US Navy's freedom of navigation operations in the increasingly contested and dangerous waters of the South China Sea. US Navy ships participating in these FONOPs are often trailed by PLAN ships and other assets. The Sea Hunter throws a new obstacle that China would need to deal with. More on that in a moment. However, it is not yet clear when the Sea Hunter will join the US Navy's fleet in a fully operational capacity. The trials are still ongoing. Building an autonomous ship is not yet easy. However, there are some promising developments. The Sea Hunter presents challenges not unlike the companies which are trying to design autonomous road vehicles. Although there are fewer surface obstacles in the ocean, the artificial intelligence steering the Sea Hunter will need to anticipate and respond to dangers on the spot without any human prompting. Thankfully for Lydos Holdings, the defense contractor behind the Sea Hunter, their project has had some promising results. The Sea Hunter has made successful ocean crossings, proving the concept of drone ships. The Sea Hunter's early tests were so satisfactory to the naval brass that some military experts anticipate that when the ship launches, it will not be limited to the primarily anti-submarine role it was initially conceived for. Instead, the Sea Hunter could take on a much broader array of missions, including surveillance, reconnaissance, and intelligence-gathering tasks. A ship of the Sea Hunter's size would also be able to carry weapons, and it seems likely that the Sea Hunter or other drone ships like it will soon bear arms. For the US Navy, the Sea Hunter's arrival is coming at a critical time. The United States has, over the last 10 years, slowly but steadily lost ground in the military balance of power in the Indo-Pacific region. China has used a lot of the money from its breakneck economic growth to build an increasingly modern navy, which has become more and more of a challenge to the US Navy in the waters near the Chinese mainland. China is not only building modern ships and aircraft carriers, but submarines as well. It has also built and militarized artificial islands in the South China Sea. These bases boast scores of ship-killing missiles. Additionally, the PLAN patrols the South China Sea aggressively, claiming that all the waters in the area fall within Chinese territory. In response to the growing power of China's PLAN, and to a lesser extent the Russian Navy, the United States Department of Defense developed its third offset strategy in the mid-2010s. The development of this doctrine signaled that American national security strategy would be shifting away from the war on terror and asymmetrical counterinsurgency campaigns and toward state-based military competition. As the United States looked to maintain its military superiority in the face of more aggressive and capable nation-states like China and Russia, who sought to challenge the US-led international order. The ACTUV program, which includes the Sea Hunter, is part of the Pentagon's approach to the new great power competition. 
Countering the growing capability of the Anti-Access and Area Denial A2AD systems of competitor states is one of the most integral parts of the third offset strategy. This idea primarily refers to China's huge arsenal of ballistic missiles, which pose terrible danger to American bases and traditional naval assets, like carrier groups in the Indo-Pacific region. A 2019 report from the U.S. Army's Center for Lessons Learned revealed part of the strategy to counter enemy A2AD assets. To offset an adversary's A2AD, the U.S. military must live and operate within the A2AD region. The National Defense Strategy NDS, represents a re-emphasis on forward presence, but a forward presence of a particular kind. It is not about presence for its own sake or for symbolic or reassurance purposes. Rather, it is about combat-credible forward forces, that is, forces that are or can rapidly get forward, survive a withering Chinese or Russian assault, and blunt the adversary's aggression. Both represent geographical challenges equal to none that the US military has encountered. Unmanned ships like the Sea Hunter are consistent with this strategy. For example, the Sea Hunter and other ships like it will increase the US Navy's capability of defying the PLAN's attempt to choke the South China Sea's waters because they will not suffer fatigue and are easily expendable. This is what Kennedy meant when he talked about overwhelming the chessboard with pawns that, on aggregate, can do the same job as, or a better job than, the higher quality pieces. In a military confrontation, many of these unmanned ships would be destroyed by enemy missiles. But because there are no human casualties on board, their loss is far more easily sustainable, and the ships themselves can be easily replaced because they are much less expensive to construct. In contrast, a traditional naval asset like an aircraft carrier falling prey to a cheap Chinese missile would involve the loss of thousands of lives and tens of billions of dollars. Meanwhile, as the Chinese missile stockpile gets depleted in taking out the cheap drones like the Sea Hunter, other, more expensive assets can be brought more confidently forward and blunt the adversary's continued aggression. In a less dramatic and far likelier scenario, the Sea Hunter is also ideal for grey zone operations. Grey zone operations are defined as a kind of hybrid warfare that skirt the line between peaceful activities and hostile ones. For example, China's use of an aggressive fishing fleet in the disputed waters of the South China Sea skirts the line between peaceful commerce and hostile force projection. These are not armed military vessels but have nonetheless sought to monopolize resources and prevent other ships from exploiting international waters or the waters that fall within the exclusive economic zones of other nations in the area, such as Vietnam and the Philippines. Similarly, China's constant air patrols that come within Taiwan's Air Defense Identification Zone ADIS, steadily exhausts the latter's resources and zaps its morale while avoiding a direct military confrontation that could be costly for the Chinese military. Cheap Sea Hunter-type drone ships can counter these grey zone operations by being easy to produce in big numbers and not falling prey to traditional fatigue or attrition items. From there, they can be sent out in large numbers to patrol the areas that countries like China want to shut off from other nations. China's shipping fleet, for example, would have a much tougher time of it if their ships constantly needed to contend with unmanned drones from other nations harassing them in the same way that they currently harass international shipping. In a world increasingly defined by the grey zone operations of authoritarian regimes like China and Russia, which are still reluctant to directly challenge the United States' traditional military superiority, drone ships will fit right in. It all sounds great if the Sea Hunter can be made operational in the near future, but can it? As of August 2023, the Sea Hunter has not yet joined the US Navy fleet. The Sea Hunter's successful ocean crossing was a major milestone. On January 31, 2019, only a year after DARPA transferred the ship to the Navy, LIDOS announced the Sea Hunter had made the voyage from San Diego to Pearl Harbor and back, less than three years after the ship was first commissioned. However, beneath this glittering announcement, it was revealed that the Sea Hunter had a manned ship monitoring it throughout the journey. Sailors also boarded the drone at times to ensure that its electronic and propulsion systems were functioning properly. But progress has been steady. In August 2022, the Sea Hunter participated in that year's Rim of Pacific exercise, a multinational effort involving 26 participants. At RIMPAC 2022, the Sea Hunter joined forces with a manned destroyer to demonstrate how traditional and drone ships might cooperate. It was one of the most eagerly anticipated parts of that year's RIMPAC event. It was also important experience, since sailors are often busy with their own tasks and do not have time to do the manned-unmanned work. The RIMPAC exercise gave them opportunity to do something they would not ordinarily do. The results at RIMPAC were apparently promising. 
with the Seahawk and Destroyer team satisfactorily integrating their anti-submarine capabilities together, doing all of the tasks the exercise's planners wanted to do. Throughout the exercise, the Sea Hunter was fully unmanned except for when it came in and out of port. Progress on the Sea Hunter seems to be proceeding satisfactorily then, although there is still no announced date for it to join the US Navy fleet beyond the current trial runs. The pressure may be building on the US Navy's brass to deliver though, because the United States is not the only country that is interested in creating drone ships. As China continues its naval buildup, it is determined not to fall behind in the drone race. It too is experimenting with unmanned surface vehicles, and the PLAN is building one that some observers call a direct knockoff of the Sea Hunter. A photo spreading round on Chinese social media in the fall of 2020 revealed a ship that looked remarkably like the US Navy's unmanned vessel. It too was a trimaran ship, and it had similar dimensions to the Sea Hunter, being about 151 feet long by 50 feet wide. Archival satellite imagery revealed that the Chinese ship was launched before August 30th, 2019, and is being built by Zhang Tongfang New Shipbuilding Company Limited in Zhuajing City, Zhangji. We do not know if this is an official Chinese government program or if it is a private effort. However, given the ties that China's corporate apparatus has with the ruling Communist Party and the doctrine of military civil fusion, where the government seeks to ensure that advances in science and technology in the civilian sector can also advance the fighting potential of China's military, it may be a distinction without a difference. China's paramount leader Xi Jinping personally oversees the military civil fusion strategy. So if the Sea Hunter knockoff is technically a private venture, it is almost certainly not independent of China's military ambitions. Although China is known for its rob, replicate and replace approach to Western military and industrial technology, the US Naval Institute USNI, noted that the Chinese Sea Hunter knockoff is unusual in the degree it copies the American aircraft, even by Chinese standards. The PLAN is experimenting with other drone ships as well, such as the Changxing-1, which it revealed in 2017. Unlike the Sea Hunter and China's copy of it, this craft is likely armed with a 12.7mm machine gun. There is also the Jari Catamaran, which can carry a 30mm cannon, anti-submarine torpedoes and surface-to-air missiles, according to USNI. The Sea Hunter knockoff is much bigger than these other unmanned craft, and while it could carry weapons, the inference that USNI makes is that it is designed primarily to be a surveillance asset like its American counterpart. China's investment in drone ship technology is strategic. Even without weapons, these ships will increase its grey zone operational capabilities, and although the Sea Hunter, and presumably its knockoff, is less capable of acting against faster nuclear submarines that can dive deeper, flooding the zone with large numbers of cheap, mass-produced drones will enhance the PLAN's anti-submarine warfare capability, something which is currently still one of its glaring vulnerabilities. As the retired American General Jack Keane, currently the chairman of the Institute for the Study of War, often says, quantity is a quality all on its own. The arrival of drone ships from both the United States and China will make that quote even clearer. Additionally, the Chinese knockoff of the Sea Hunter will be much more capable of counteracting the subsurface vessels of America's allies in the Indo-Pacific region. For example, Japan, India and Australia, the United States partners in the Quad, do not have nuclear submarines. Like China, they too run on diesel-electric-based submarines, making them ideal targets for China's new drone ship. The Sea Hunter is only one of the first drone ships. The US Navy is currently experimenting with several other types, including the Sea Shadow, Sea Fighter, Sea Jet, and Sea Slice. In the coming decades, we should expect even bigger ones, carrying more sophisticated systems and weapons, to take their place alongside traditional ships and probably replace some of them. Will the US Navy sailor be yet another job that artificial intelligence threatens to replace? What do you think? Let us know your thoughts about the Sea Hunter and the future of drones in naval warfare. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel for more military analysis from military experts.